Bases dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's a Tuesday. It is September 29th. It's a Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. So if you have thoughts on anything, uh, you know, we'd prefer soccer related, but, you know, anything, uh, share them with us on Twitter at Soccer Down Here. On the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here, or via email, soccer down here at gmail. Let us know what you're thinking about today. We've got a few different things to get into. The Gold Cup groups are mostly drawn. We'll talk about that. Our friend Bart Keeler has a new piece up at SoccerDownHere.net on the U.S. route in the Gold Cup and what it means. We'll talk a little bit about how the rosters are going to look for next summer because it gets very, very complicated for national team managers in this region with a lot of competitions going on at the same time. We'll get into the weekend that was in Major League Soccer. Uh, We talked a lot about Atlanta yesterday. We'll talk about the rest of the league today. We'll start to look ahead a little bit, get into what the playoff picture is currently looking like. Uh, We'll get into lots of different things today. Copa Libertadores returns. Match day five starts tonight. We'll get into that, what matches are on on the card for you, uh, what the juice boxes look like in said matches. There's Champions League qualifiers today as well. Um, all kinds of different things happening. Carabao Cup. I mean, you got a little bit of everything. Um, some crazy things being said in different parts of the world. We'll get into that too. Uh, also, some updates on uh, financials and current situations as clubs are dealing with the pandemic and kind of what it all means. So, all kinds of different things to jump into today. John, where do you want to start? Uh, let's start where we ended last night on soccer over there with the live coverage of the Gold Cup draw. We haven't had a chance to talk about it on this particular program yet, but it was uh, it had its moments last night. <laughs> it had its moments last night. It had its moments. <laughs> what does that mean? See who the U.S. is going to be paired with and who you don't want to see coming out of the preliminary group. Okay. Do you want to start down this conversation? Sure. <laughs> That was a uh, very was, broad it open. To, it was fun to watch. It was it was fun to watch uh, grown men stirring uh, replica soccer balls. That's what they always do. Watching. I know. <laughs> like that's I, nothing new. Don't hate on Concacaf for that one. That's just by the then, book. And so so here's your groups. And so here's how here's how it laid out at the end of the evening. Group A: Mexico, El Salvador, Curacao, and the survivor of the prelim group number nine. Group Which B. could be. Who, who could it be? Because I just have prelim nine. Right we'll, we'll come back to it then. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, group B. U.S., Canada, Martinique, and a prelim group number seven's survivor. And you don't want Haiti. That was the point that you made last night. You don't want Haiti coming out as prelim group seven. Group C. Costa Rica, Jamaica, Suriname, and then the survivor of preliminary group eight and group D Honduras, Panama, Grenada. And are we going with Qatar or Qatar? I don't know. Um, I've heard both by lots of different people. Um, Qatar, I think is a little more common. I'm assuming with the pounding on the keyboard, you're, you're checking. No, no, no. I mean, (laughs) Qatar seems to be the one that's done these days. I grew up on Qatar. So I See, just naturally, it, naturally for me, I've gravitated toward Qatar. I think because I, I remember going down this road to try to figure this out, and there was not really a clear cut setup. Um, Qatar is what I had always heard. Then I think during the bidding for the World Cup that they were awarded, Qatar became a, a more common usage. But I don't think there is an exact, like, this is right, this is wrong. And that's what's frustrating about it. Um, So I don't know. Uh, If anybody has any guidance for us on this, please do so in the Twitch pitch or on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think there's a right and a wrong on this one. But they're in Group D. They're with Honduras, Panama, Grenada. Um, That's going to be a 
a strange one. Honduras and Panama should go through. Grenada is a, a total unknown here as to where they could fall. And Qatar is, we really don't know where they stand at this point, to be perfectly honest. This is a big opportunity for them. They were a little better than expected in the last Copa America that they participated in, but I wouldn't exactly call it good. Now, where do they stand here? And we'll have to see. Uh, Group C, work backwards. Costa Rica, Jamaica should go through there. Not a whole lot to worry about. U.S. and Canada should go through and be, although Martinique could be a bit of a surprise. And Group A, Mexico, El Salvador, Curacao. El Salvador, Curacao will be a very interesting battle for the number two spot. Uh, Shiva says it's the one that I said, Qatar. Okay. Okay. So we'll go with Qatar. Uh, Cassie says it's not Qatar. So who started that Qatar thing, and, and why do they I need to be smacked? they did. They, well, if they did, then they get to call it, right? Like, that's not, that doesn't make sense then. Yeah, so uh, it's in part of the in, – in international discussions, I started hearing folks from the Middle East saying Qatar. And that was, that was where the Qatar bit came from for me. Okay. So other other Middle Eastern nations were saying Qatar. I heard nas- other national uh, uh, news organizations saying Qatar, but I've always gone with. Well, n- n- uh, yeah. Hold hold on, hold on. That none of that gives us anything. That's the part problem here. I've always heard Qatar, yep. and then Qatar started to become more commonly used. But if if they want it to be Qatar, then it's Qatar. But I don't think that's true. That's the the thing that I'm I'm saying is I don't think they said we want to be called Cutter now. I'm just looking it up. I'm seeing where the Cutter yes. came let's, from. Let's get down to this. This is what we do around here. Sometimes we get on rabbit holes and we try to solve problems and we're trying to solve a problem. I don't need to know where Cutter came from. I just want to know how they want their country to be pronounced so we get it correct. Um, Katie Weaver says I think it's pronounced human rights violations, which there's also that. <laughs> Not wrong. Uh, there's also that. That is true. Um Lots, of, and we have a a link Abby sent in the Twitch pitch that um, how it's pronounced in Arabic, and that's where people are saying maybe it sounds like cutter in that. Oh, gutter, yeah, okay. What? Okay, no, it's um, boarding area. I'm going through uh, people area. who've had some interaction with the region might say gutter a bit more, a bit more, but that's not inaccurate either. So we have. We now have a third one in the room. Okay, that one has not been used in this part of the world, so I don't know that one. Okay. Since the Arabic letter kaf or kaf doesn't exist in most European languages, an approximation is necessary. The closest in English is gutter, definitely not Qatar, as is frequently heard. However, the caveat to all of this is that when speaking English and speaking of foreign nations, it doesn't always have to be restricted to mimicking the native pronunciation. That's true, but... That's also I, I, okay. Uh, this is a long way of saying that uh, that Qatar pronounced Qatar is probably more in vogue now. It's replacing the older way Qatar. People who have had some interaction with the region might say gutter a bit more. Not inaccurate either. As many Qataris will tell you, the pronunciation can vary. But it wouldn't be Qataris then, would it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I thought if if we were going Qatar, it was Qataris. But we said we're not going that because you just said that that's not the way to do it. <laughs> it's one of several. Apparently, look, apparently it's choice D, all the above. You're not so open, John. we're not going to lose any way here. Although okay. Katie Weavers is also correct. Okay, it's 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 significantly closer to Qatar than it is to Qatar. Some golfies like to say gutter, which is probably the easiest pronunciation for anyone who's not familiar with the cough sound. In normal English, it's cutter. When talking to Arabs, you could say cutter or gutter, depending on how they pronounce their coughs. So Shiva says it's not R. It, it, it is R, not er. That is the difference. Okay. Oh, this is really tricky because and now I, I do push back a little bit on what whatever you were reading from that, that says you don't have to mimic how it's said. No, you. I would always go with the lo- with with the local thing. I would try to. Yeah. Um, this is a tough one because it is. It's a a letter that's not actually the, the same in English. So it, it's we're kind of guessing and trying to figure this out. Um, you have to figure this out. 
I mean, we're going to work on this. Um, it is not Qatar. that we've, we've learned that. That is not accurate. They are trying to be more proper to the way it is said in Arabic. And we are going to try to do that as well because that's how we try to pronounce names and things around here. So we're going to try. Um, it sounds like it is somewhere between cutter and cutter, like, more like guttural, like cutter. Yep. It's like a GC somewhere in between that. You're yep. going to have to practice this. Um, Captain is, is trying to uh, start something, and I know where you're going, Captain. I got it. I got it. Uh, it says, Jason, how do you pronounce the road that starts with Ponce? Well, in Atlanta, if you call it Ponce de Leon, people are going to be like, where are you talking about? What? Uh-huh. So you have to go down that road here. But that's how it's pronounced in Atlanta. If I went to Spain and started talking about Ponce de Leon, uh, I'd, be like, huh? I'd be laughed out of the room. Yeah. So that's where you are to a degree, and it's more for being understood. It's not right, but that has become the common thing. This goes back to our whole Tito Vialba, Tito Vialba thing. Yes. Um, and people had different takes on, is that accurate to say Vijalba? I mean, it's, it's how it's pronounced in Argentina. It's how you know, his, his mother would call him. Vialba is not wrong in other parts of the Spanish-speaking world. So I opted for the Argentine pronunciation because he was Argentine. And we ended up going with the more common Spanish pronunciation, which would be Vialba in most parts of the Spanish-speaking world. That's a little different than just completely mispronouncing something. And that's what's hard. Um, I do not subscribe to the theory that I've seen from some in the game. Uh, Talk Sport had a big conversation about this, that you can just pronounce it however you want. And it doesn't matter how it's pronounced. No, no, no. No. There are some challenges with it when you get into letters that are not replicable in English, which you have to kind of figure out and, and what's acceptable and what's not. And you do get into what captain is saying about how it's pronounced locally versus that but that's a ponce is a little different yeah because if you call it ponce people are not going to know what you're talking about here and you do have to be understood but if i call a player tito vialba or tito vialba instead of saying tito vialba yeah then that's just mispronouncing it that's a difference so okay Slate. The, <laughs> the most accurate English estimate is something halfway between cutter and gutter. It's not Qatar, the pronunciation okay. that has become the standard among TV okay. newscasters. Okay. The number, Arabic uh, language. Uh, stop, stop. number one, we are eliminating Qatar yes. from how you pronounce this. That is not in the records anymore. That's not how we're going to say it around here. Got it. Got it. The Arabic language, particularly the colloquial dialect common in the Arabian Peninsula, features several sounds that are completely alien to native English speakers, beginning with the initial consonant in cutter. The Q makes for a hard K sound, but one with its origins deep within the throat. A poor English equivalent is the C in cough. The, fir- the word's first vowel sound is similar to aw, as in aw shucks, but not nearly as heavy on the W. Cotter? Cotter? Yeah. Something yeah, like probably. that? Is that, yeah. is that decent? Somewhere, somewhere between cutter and gutter. So cutter? Almost well, like some, some, cutter. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Look, yeah. What you said is somewhere between cutter and gutter. Right. Cutter is nowhere between those. So it's not between those. It's the Q is not pronounced as a Q. It it's is a somewhere between. It, it's not a K. A hard K sound. Never mind. We're, we're not going to do this anymore because you're con- <laughs> you, you, I don't know what's going on. You're, you're confusing me, baffling. Um, yes, and Mateo Hosatu. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Ricky Ricardo says PT versus PT. It was not PT. And I think sometimes people overdid that. It's, it, these things are tough because these are different languages and these are how it's said. But it wasn't pity, like the English word pity, and it wasn't PD, like. P.D. Simpson or something, you know, some kid from down the neighborhood. P.D. Pablo. Yes, or P.D. Pablo. It wasn't that. It was somewhere in between. Hooked on phonics down here, absolutely. Linguistics <laughs> down here, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. This is what we do. Uh, we will not put the Southerners in charge of figuring that out. That is accurate, Katie. Somewhere between Cutter and Cotter. I think that's the last one as I'm getting closer. But we will work on this, and we will have it right before the Gold Cup starts next summer. Because they will be in Group D, and they will be playing Honduras and, and Panama and Grenada. 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 Let me get this all right. I'm going to go 
proper with all this as best as I can today and not be a gringo guy. Okay. The ones everybody wants to talk about is Group B with the United States and Canada who have to play each other and battle it out again after an interesting pair of matches in the Nations League where Canada took care of business and Canada, the U.S. took care of business here. I thought Canada was horrible in the, the second game. And Canada's still trying to prove themselves as a true contender here. And both should go through. They're favored to go through. But that match will have a little extra juice to it next summer. Yeah, and we we all know with the history in the last year and the, the disappointing results that happened in previous competitions, and, and I know that we'll get into it also, but uh, just what the lineups could look like for all of these competitions that are going to be uh, as a part of schedule compression. I know Soccer America kind of broke it down pretty well this morning, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you look at, you look at your group, you look at your group stage, then you look at the possible lineups and it adds a whole nother dynamic to this whole thing in three dimensions as you're trying to sprint toward national, co- uh, multiple competition. Yeah. Let's, let's look at the calendar for next summer because it's complicated. Um, the gold cup's going to be very, very complicated. So next year, your number one priority for the national team is world cup qualifying. That's going to start in September. Remember how we've talked all since the the restart of action about how everything's getting compressed. You had to finish last season. You had a short break. You started into the new season. You've got European competitions for players. You've got cup competitions. You've got all kinds of stuff going on. You're finishing at the same time, but you started late, which means it's compressed. You're playing a lot of games in a short period of time. You've got the Nations Cup, the Nations League, in early June. That's the semifinal and the final. That will be the full national team, best 11s. U.S. will go for that completely. Then July 10th to August 1st, they've got the Gold Cup. July 22nd to August 7th, you've got the Olympics, which will be the U23s plus three up to three overage players, if you so choose. The U-20 World Cup will be May 20th to June 12th, and we don't know when CONCACAF qualifying will be for that. The number one thing is qualifying. That doesn't start till September. But players are going to need a break. Major European clubs are going to want their players to get a break. They're not going to want them to come play in the Gold Cup. I think the Gold Cup will not be the top, top team. I just don't see how it's possible. Um, That's going to be interesting across the board with the, the, the Euros, Copa America, Gold Cup, all of those competitions, because teams are going to have to balance these players getting the rest that they need, the clubs begging for their players to get the rest that they need, and competing in continental championships. It's going to be brutal. Um, I don't think you're going to see the top team. But then the flip side is this. You're not going to be able to turn to a bunch of young players because your best are going to be at the U23s in the Olympics. Um, your U20s, who some could factor in, they're going to be coming off of playing in a World Cup that would finish June 12th if you get all the way to the final. They're going to need a break. But maybe some of them come back into the Gold Cup, possibly. And you're going to see some MLS players in the Gold Cup as well, but they're going to be in the middle of their season that will probably take a short break, as we've typically seen, but not during the whole competition. So MLS teams are not going to want to lose a bunch of players either, balancing the roster selection with what the players need, what their clubs need, and what the competitions demand is going to be a really difficult juggling act for Greg Berhalter. Yeah, and I I know that we all want to be as successful in all of these competitions as humanly possible, but, you know, for... In looking at the analysis, it's not going to be first choice for Gold Cup. And then it's going to be the challenge for the coaching staff and how you're going to try to orchestrate things and how you're going to try to get out a group first and foremost and then work your way through. I mean, and then let me ask you this. When it comes to Gold Cup, and this is the, the way too early analysis part of the program, what should a realistic expectation be considering that this would probably be the third choice lineup in all these competitions? <laughs> Who knows? Getting out of group? No. So you're expecting the U.S. third base team to be worse than Martinique? 
No. Or the winner of the prelims? Well, but that's out getting of out of group. No, 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 getting no. Out, getting out of uh-uh. group into the knockouts. That's finishing top two. So you're you're telling me that if getting out of the group is acceptable, just getting out of the group is acceptable, you're telling me they're going to have to battle with Martinique and the winner of the prelims because the top two get out of the group. Right. So you're and telling me think, it's not a guarantee we, that you think, get through. And if we think that that prelim is going to be Haiti. That's still difficult, but, and, but yes, your your third, your, your, if it's your number three team, they should get through that. No, don't give them a pass. Uh-uh. Don't give them a pass and say, oh, we'll just get out of the group's okay. No. Is that where we're at? Really? That's not where I'm at. That's what you just said. That's why I'm, I'm pushing back so hard. I'm asking the question, but that's though. But this is why I'm pushing back, John, because it shouldn't be a question. To ask the question means there is a question about the U.S.'s depth not being able to compete with Martinique and Haiti or whoever else comes out of the prelims. That should not be a question. That should not be a valid question. I'm not saying you're wrong for asking it. I'm, I'm saying if people think that, that's a sad indictment on where the U.S. national team program is. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's the case at all. One couple of bad results, because that's what it turned into. They should have qualified for 18. Klinsman shouldn't have started the way he did. Arena should have closed it out. People took that as an indictment on talent level. It was an indictment on those two coaches, Right. number one. The talent level, yeah, you had a little bit of a, a lesser group at that time. You still should have qualified. There's no way. Don't argue with me that you should not have qualified based on talent. You didn't qualify because two coaches dropped points in games they shouldn't have dropped points in. That's different. So, to carry on, when now you've had a number of players break through, your talent level is better. Is it endless? No. But Martinique players and and Haitian players across the board are not playing in big roles at MLS clubs and USL championship clubs. So how is a U.S. team that would be based off of some European players, some young players, probably a core from MLS, worried about getting through in that? They should not be. That's, that's where the U.S. expectation has to be. It can't be just getting out of the group. If, if that is what is an acceptable expectation, forget it. Forget it. Don't play. Because you're scared. You can't do that. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth team should be better to get out of that group with Martinique and the winner of the prelims. They should be. And if they're not, then somebody screwed up. There's no way around it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give excuses that it's the third team. Now, are they gonna be able to beat Mexico with a third team? No, different conversation. Are they gonna have problems with a Costa Rica and a Honduras? Different conversation. Because you're talking about a different talent level. Yeah. Martinique and the winner of the prelims, no 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 no. That's not the same talent level. That that has to be understood. So no excuses for <laughs> you better get out of the group. And you better not lose to Canada with whatever group you have, because Canada might not have their first choice either. Yeah. No, there, uh, there's no expectation of that. Go ahead. Prelim group seven is Haiti, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, Bermuda, and Barbados. It should be Haiti, although Bermuda could be a challenge. Um, St. Vincent could be a challenge. It should be Haiti. Um, but any of those, that should not be the issue. So the, the U.S. should get out of the group, no question. Uh, Bart chimes in and says... Uh, the U.S. should absolutely advance out of the group, no matter what the team it fields. Even if it's a Best Americans and MLS squad, we've seen those teams make Gold Cup finals before. It's very likely that Pulisic, Adams, Dest, and McKinney will play Olympics, but mm-hmm. there are decent enough second-choice players ready to play in Gold Cup and qualifiers. That's true, and the qualifiers won't be till September. So I think the way it'll probably go is you'll see the best team you can put forward in the Nations League semifinal and final. You got to get past the semifinal to get to the final. That'll be your top top team. You'll see your best U twenty threes go to the Olympics. Um, you'll see some players get a rest who might need it. Yeah. And then you'll see the best of the rest at the Gold Cup, and those players will have an opportunity to impress for when qualifiers start in September, along with those U twenty threes, and potentially along with some of the U twenties to make the qualifying squad, which will be your, your best again that you can field, but that'll be in September. So I think that'll be the balance, and yeah, you've got the talent to do it. There's, 
this idea that the U.S. doesn't have enough talent, it wasn't the case in 2017 at all for me. It's not the case now. It's so much better than it was then, and there's so many more young players emerging. Talent's not the issue. Yeah. Uh, preliminary group, uh, to go with group A, they get preliminary group nine, Mexico, El Salvador, Curacao, and the fourth being either Trinidad, Tobago, Montserrat, Cuba, and French Guiana. Should be Trinidad and Tobago. Cuba could be a bit of a surprise, but it should be Trinidad and Tobago. And then group C gets prelim group eight, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Suriname, and either Guatemala, Guiana, Guadalupe, or the Bahamas. Uh, should be Guatemala. Guiana would be the one that could be a surprise, but it should be Guatemala. So it should be Haiti, Guatemala, and Trinidad and Tobago, who are your your prelim qualifiers. Um, That's what it should be. Uh, Questions from the Twitch pitch, and we'll get to them on Twitter as well, about U.S. qualifying. Um, J-Dub Parker says, could Bello make the Olympic squad, or is it too soon for that? I don't think it's too soon for that. He should be part of the U-20s. Um, we'll see when qualifying is, but he should be part of the U-20 World Cup squad if they qualify. That's target one. Could he be part of a Gold Cup or uh, Olympic squad? He could. Um, I have to look at the overall pool when you get to U-23 at left back. He could. I, I don't think it's it's crazy to think that he could. U-20 is the target first, and when he completes that, we'll have a better sense. If, if he does well at the U-20 World Cup, then yeah, he could absolutely get pushed in um, to the Olympics. I think that would be the, the step, but it's going to depend on the pool, and it's going to depend on how he performs, because he'd be one of the youngest players there. Another question about Miles Robinson. Um, Miles will be part of, of something with this. There's just no question. I, I'd, I'd be blown away if he's not. It would mean that he hasn't been healthy in a long time or that his form is completely dipped. The conversation about his form dipping right now, I think, is unfair. Um, it's not the case to me. He's not 100% fit, and that's showing, and that's a problem because that's been consistent since uh, the the injury with the national team late last year where he missed the rest of the season, and then he got injured in preseason, and then he hasn't looked right consistently with the first team this season with Atlanta United you got to get him right. If he is, is right physically, he's playing next summer in a U.S. shirt um, somewhere. There's just there, there, I, I don't think that's even a concern. Uh, Bart on the Bellow question, he says he could, in quotes, but that group includes Dest, Anthony Robinson, Sam Vines, Chase Gasper, and others in the pool. Um, Bart doesn't think he's a full national team player right now. Several good left backs ahead of him even in that Olympic pool. And he, he'd be age eligible for the 24 Olympics, which is a good point. Um, Dest, I would assume, and it's going to depend on what happens, and today you could get an update on Serginho Dest going to Barcelona. It sounds like that's where he wants to go. The deal is, is done, according to Fabrizio Romano, just waiting on the final announcement. So Dest could play a lot of games between now and then. He might need the summer off um, outside of the CONCACAF Nations League. Anthony Robinson, we'll have to see where he is at that point. If And I'm just working backwards. If Dest is off, let's say, because he plays a good number of games, Robinson moves into the number one spot, um, and he could be, correct me if I'm wrong, he could be uh, Olympics age eligible, I believe. Um, Vines would be in the mix. Gasper would be in the mix. I think Bello, Vines, and Gasper, there's not much of a difference between them. And I'd put Bello ahead of Gasper defensively. Um, and I need to see. I need to check in on Sam Vines again. I haven't seen much of him lately to watch his game and how it's developed. But Bello, for me, is in that group behind Dest and Robinson. So if Dest has the summer off... Bello could get moved into that, but he will be coming off of a U-20 tournament that he's going to miss time with Atlanta United because the U-20s is not a... You're not taking a break during that tournament for MLS. So, as we saw it with Ezekiel Barco last time, he'll play in the U-20s, I believe. He will miss time. Atlanta United might make the request, and I would think it'd probably be granted if he misses time with the U-20s to not have to miss time during the summer at the club level. So it could be a situation where he is worthy of it, 
But because of these political ramifications that you got to deal with negotiating with clubs and releases, they might let him stay with Atlanta United in the summer. We'll have to see how it all shakes out, but U20 is his first target. Miles was born March 14, 1997. So currently 23. So he would... And I and have they said, are they changing the U23 cutoff date? Is it players who were eligible for the Olympics that should have been held this year? Or have they bumped it that's, back? That's the question. I don't know if of, they have yet. I don't know yeah, if they've made that determination. Anything. So, yeah. Uh, Robinson would be part of the Gold Cup squad, I would believe, unless he gets called into that Nations League and then they decide to look at other players in the Gold Cup. You've got players to look at. I don't think there's a position where you're not going to be able to find somebody to play. You're going to be okay. Um, this gets you into a question that Mezzano has, and I, I want to bring this up because this is something I think Atlanta United fans are sensitive to, and I think a lot of club fans are sensitive to, and it's becoming more of an issue in the United States than it ever has been. Mizano says, am I the only person who doesn't want our club team players going off to play a national team play since we have not had the best luck at getting them back healthy? In the past, and, and I'm sure Bart can speak to this as part of the American Outlaws chapter here in Atlanta, when, when soccer in the U.S. started to grow, it grew off the back of the national team. It wasn't the club game. It was the national team. And that continued for a, a long time. That wasn't just a pre-MLS thing. That was through 2002, absolutely. And you could even say through 2010, um, in a lot of parts of the country, not everywhere, but in a lot. Now, we're in a different place because of this very type of conversation. You've got fans who are fully invested in the day-to-day with their club. This is what has come up more often in England, um, in Germany, in Spain, in other countries where the club game has dramatically eclipsed the national team game. In the United States, that was reversed for a long time, and it's been maybe the last couple of, of years. You could even go back to 16, 17, maybe, but even 2014, it was national team, MLS is completely secondary in terms of driving the game forward. Now, I think we're having a different conversation because you've got clubs that are growing the game in their areas and clubs that are investing a lot of money and clubs that have this exact question. Not even just the fans, the clubs are like, hey, we sent you Miles Robinson, you sent him back injured, that affected our playoff run. Right. Um, why should we play nice with you? And then the player gets caught in the middle because it is an honor to represent your national team. There's no question. It is still a big deal. It always will be. I, I, people who try to say, like, no national team play ever, no. That, that's, that's not going to work in this game, and it shouldn't. Do they have to find a better balance? Yes, because we don't need all these friendlies. I'm sorry. The, the random friendlies where players are flying halfway across the world don't need those. The club game is, is bigger and needs that time. The competitions and qualifying for competitions, I'm fine. Do you want to maybe try to find ways to limit the number of games you're playing in qualification? You would, but you want your biggest teams to qualify as well, and the fewer games means it's more of a crapshoot. So that's a balance you're going to have to strike, FIFA and the clubs and the confederations. But in the United States, I think it's finally flipped to where Mezzano's point is not the outlier anymore. Fans don't necessarily want to see their players go to the national team because they worry about what it does to their club. Yeah, MLS has to start, and I know this year's different. I'm, I'm not criticizing them for right now playing through international breaks. This is a different year. Going forward and when you get things somewhat back to normal in terms of your scheduling, MLS has to take all international breaks off. No, don't give teams the option to play on international breaks. That has to happen. If that means an extra midweek game during the season, extra two, that's just what you got to do. Take the international breaks off. But when you're getting into these friendly situations, and, and Miles was not that situation last year, but when you're getting into a friendly situation, yeah, I think clubs are going to refuse to send players more and more out of MLS. I think that's going to happen. 
uh, FIFA back in April extended the age limit for the Tokyo Olympics to 24 from 23. Okay. okay. So yeah, it's it's basically so guys that were eligible now could play next summer. Yeah. Oh, it's that time. Oh, wow. Well. You needed to open the uh, the new two liter of Mountain Dew, huh? Yes, sir. You got you got your uh, is that Coke Energy this morning? Yeah. I mean, are you pouring the two liter Mountain Dew just in the cup, no ice? In the cup, no ice. <sighs> One day you'll learn, sir. Bruh. Um, okay. Nice sound effects for that, though. That's awesome. That's good work. Well, that's what happens when you have a new microphone. Yeah, yeah, it actually works. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> Captain Ragamuffin says, playing well at the U-20 World Cup means nothing. And it says, according to Doug, we had the conversation about this on the Southern Fried Soccer podcast. Uh, I know a couple people listened to it and uh, talked about it. I, the U-20 World Cup means a lot, in my opinion. It means a lot for major clubs in terms of their recruitment of players. If George Bellows called up for the U-20 World Cup, I think he goes, and I, I think mm-hmm. Atlanta United sends him with their blessing, and they want him to go and, and ball out. Um, a World Cup's a different conversation than even a Nations League, to me. A uh, Nations League is, is secondary. I'm, I'm getting to the point where I feel like Nations League should be treated like friendlies, where it's optional to be released for that. Um, I've come around on this too. I mean, it's the, the national team was the most important thing in this country. And that's maybe what we've learned from not qualifying for the last world cup was you, you can handle that and it's okay. Um, it's not good. It's not a good place to be, but doesn't mean the game's going to go away. 2010, it would have had a, a much bigger implication. Uh, before that it would have been catastrophic. Uh, 2014 maybe was in the in between 2018 it it stunk it it took a hit on the federation's finances which affects everything that is not good but it didn't slow down the growth of the game in this country and i think that would be the case going forward now you don't qualify back to back then we're having maybe a different conversation but in general and it's about to get easier to qualify anyway it's going to be okay the national team's not as important in setting the agenda for soccer in this country as it used to be. And they have to figure out how to balance the number of games players are playing at the club level, the number of competitions they're in, with the number of competitions they are in at the national team level. There's got to be a better balance of that. FIFA, the clubs, the, the confederations have to sit at the table and sort this out. Now's the time because you're able to kind of redraw things a little bit with what everybody's been going through. Do it. Get on the same page with this now for the player's sake. Bart came in on the Twitter side and he says, uh, he says his quick takes on the hashtag Gold Cup draw. One, could be a tricky group for USMNT. We got into that. Group D is the group of death for Bart. Yeah, I think Group D is the, the trickiest one because I just I, I don't know exactly what kind of level uh, Cutter is going to come in with. And uh, Granada should be the weakest team here, I think, but not by a huge margin. Honduras and Panama, it's a bit of a toss-up. Uh, two teams with some youth breaking through, but a little bit older generation. So that group's more of a toss-up. It's the group of death because anybody could come out of it. I think sometimes we, we go group of death because it has the these big, huge teams in it. Right. I'm, I'm with Bart on it. Group of death is the one that anybody could go out of and anybody could go home out of. Yeah. And that's what D feels like. He says it's uh, pretty random, in quotation marks, that we drew Canada again. And four, he likes how CONCACAF is using Nations League to determine competition rankings. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I'm just curious how you balance it with with Nations League now going forward, and this is what's hard for a confederation like Concacaf, which is unique. U.S., Mexico, Costa Rica to a lesser extent, maybe even Honduras to a lesser extent, don't need Nations League. Canada needs Nations League. El Salvador needs Nations League. Guatemala needs Nations League. The much smaller countries dramatically need Nations League. They've got to play competitive games to get better. And they've got to play these games for financial reasons, too. And CONCACAF needs to sell sponsorships for financial reasons. And all of that factors into where 
U.S. and Mexico and and Costa Rica and Honduras are like, okay, yeah, we get it. We'll we'll play and we'll 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 take it seriously. It's it's a necessary thing. Um, Europe is a little different. I I don't honestly know if UEFA and the the major countries, which there's so many of them, really care about the development of the game in Liechtenstein and in. Uh, Moldova and in Cyprus and in Faroe Islands. I don't think that really matters here. Uh, CONCACAF, you have more of those minnows, as they say. You yeah. have more of them, and you're trying to raise them up. I do like that the Gold Cup is 16 teams now as opposed to you know, 10 qualifiers plus two guests. 16 is where it should be. I, I'm assuming there was uh, money that changed hands when it came to uh, Qatar coming into it i would guess um yeah i get it uh they did play in copa america too so Concacaf's not the only ones here going forward i'd love to see it be a 16 team tournament of only Concacaf teams yeah and yes i can go ahead and, and preliminarily say that you will have blowouts in the first round with some of the teams that get in as the team 15 and 16 it will happen and that's part of raising the level. It was the same thing in the Women's World Cup when they expanded. It was the same thing when the World Cup expanded. It's the same conversation that we have every single time. But it's necessary for the level to be raised. Because Suriname can't get better if they're not playing Costa Rica in a competitive match. So, you can't. It's just what it is. Um, okay. What else we got on the Twitters? Michael Head says, uh, I agree, keep our players at the club. Fight having to release to national teams. Seriously, what is our win, in quotation marks? Joseph, I think, Barco and Robinson all hurt during national team call-ups. Sorry, the USMNT call-ups are not worth it. That team is a disaster. Who said this? Michael Head. It's not a disaster. Michael, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, (laughs) The U.S. was a disaster in 2017. It is 2020, and the U.S. team is really very interesting to me. Uh, when you have the potential to see Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, Gio Reyna, Christian Pulisic in the attack, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to see yeah. it. I, I want to see where this team can go. Serginho Dest um, or Anthony Robinson. I want to see where this team can go. It's not a disaster anymore. We need to stop that. Now, the idea, again, the, the whole thing, getting past the bluster, is... Do club fans, if, if your investment, your emotional investment is your local team, do you care about national team play in the same way? In the past, in the United States, people cared more about the national team than their local team. That has flipped dramatically in recent years, and that's good. I think that's good for the overall growth of the game because the national team doesn't play week in, week out. Your club team does. But there is a balance, and I do think it's important to have national team play. They've got to balance it better. Um, but no, it's not a disaster. I got to disagree with that, Michael. Um, I think you're you're maybe having flashbacks to Trinidad and Tobago, yeah, where uh, that was a disaster, and that was a Bruce Arena disaster. I'm waiting for Shooter McGavin to come charging into the the chat and going nuts. Does anybody know what's going on here? No, no, not not, not asking for Bruce to come into it because he would just tell me off and and be upset about it. And get fuzzy mouthed. Probably. He screwed up in Trinidad and Tobago, and he cost the U.S. going to the World Cup. Flat out. He put the wrong team on the field. He didn't have the tactics right for the day. Played the same players that had played a few days before. He had one holding midfielder in a game where he knew the other team was going to be direct. Um, he he got it wrong, and he cost him the World Cup. Jurgen Klinsmann dug a hole that he had to climb out of, and he got his head out of the hole. That's what's so frustrating about it, is, is he got to where he could see. He could see the World Cup. And then he got the tactics wrong and he fell back in. So not qualifying, and this is why I don't think it's a disaster. They should have qualified. The coaching from two different people in two different ways at two different times made them not qualify. They should have qualified. So uh, it's not a disaster. You do have to balance it better, though. And... The Miles Robinson situation has turned a lot of Atlanta United fans off from the national team. There's no question. Mm-hmm. There's no question. And it was completely unnecessary. There was no need for anything strenuous after that game. And especially, as Frank DeBoer had said, 
when they were advised to take it easy with Miles Robinson because he had played a lot of games. This goes to something we're seeing now. You wonder why Miles was pulled out at halftime. You wonder why Mateo Sosetu was pulled out. You wonder why Adam John was pulled out when he was. The sports science department is monitoring these things so you don't play them too long, too far, and they get hurt. Mm -hmm. And they had monitored it to the point with Miles that they said, hey, he's played a lot. Take it easy on him. Nothing that's unnecessary. Running after a game is completely unnecessary. If you needed him to play, you called him in, you needed him to play, and he gets hurt in a game, I'm not having the same reaction. Not at all. It, it would not be pleasant, but I would defend the national team program in that one 100%. Having him run after a game where it's not necessary. And nobody ever got to the bottom of the story, and I, look, I don't know why, but there were reports that it was not just the random cool-down jogging you see after a game. That's the key here. You see players, and, and we watched it on the the feed from Chicago. Chicago players who didn't play jogged. Jogged lightly. I've been in teams before. I've taken teams on the road. When teams in the NPSL ride in a, in a van for three hours to go play somewhere, and then you've got guys who don't get into the match and don't play, yeah, they will jog lightly afterwards that's it they're not running a session they're not sprinting they're jogging by some accounts that night at Audi Field it was not just jogging it was a session there were there was a setup of a session and that's when Robinson got injured and and that's unacceptable but that doesn't make the whole national team program a disaster and 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 that's that's the issue here Atlanta fans are going to be jaded about it, which is understandable. Um, but you don't want to keep players away from having that opportunity. And you, and Michael mentioned Joseph in that. That's a whole different conversation. You know, does the U.S. national team have the same pull for Miles Robinson or George Bello than the Venezuelan national team has for Joseph Martinez? I don't think it does. Joseph's in a very unique cycle with Venezuela, and he will play for Venezuela next year when he's healthy where they could qualify for the World Cup for the first time ever. That's, that's game-changing for the game in that country. So it's not gonna, he's going to play, and, and that's going to be a priority for him. And you want to get the best out of him, you embrace that that's a priority for him. And that's fine. Yes, you're going to be holding your breath when he plays. You are. And I get it. But the boost that you will get from him at the club level if he plays well for Venezuela is worth it it's it's worth it so um the, the national team conversation has been interesting this morning no I like it I mean even the the points that you know if, if I disagree with you that's just my personal opinion I just disagree the conversation is good and I've been curious as to where it was going since we haven't seen national team play in a while since we're about to get a lot of it since it's about to get more complicated with these squads and this many games and, and navigating all of it. It's been interesting to get a feel for where people kind of are about this. And the, the, the natural inclination to be, to not want to release players to the national team after the miles Robinson situation. For me, it's a, that is a natural reaction to what happened. And I, I vaguely remember some kind of, it was either a still or some kind of Zapruder film that came out from that that match that night where you see Miles and he's off in the distance like an ant about nine miles away from where that particular camera was and you either you see him either down or you see him fall and so those kinds of things but no I understand the trepidation for Atlanta United fans because of what happened to Miles I understand that completely now the uh, the great debate in American soccer has come back up in the Twitch pitch. The, uh, the boo Michael Bradley, and I think Josie Altador got lumped into this too, uh, campaign. Bart was a, a key member of Team Boo Bradley. Make sure I didn't get that wrong. I think that's correct, Bart. Yell at me if I, I got it wrong. Um, he said his passion and drive during the 18 cycle was lacking. It seeped into the team. I'll disagree with that. I, I, I understood the booing in 2017, yeah, at the game against Toronto, yeah. I don't understand it from 2018 onwards. I think just, it's it's gotten ridiculous. Just it's like 
you do it the first time, and then just it's it should be done. I, I feel like the brunt of the blame was put on Bradley and Josie to a lesser extent, but on Bradley, and it wasn't just Bradley. Um, if you wanted to boo anybody, and this is this is my opinion on it, uh, Bruce Arena when he returned should have been booed because yeah. he cost him the World Cup to me. I mean, I. Yeah. I remember on the show that morning saying, Trinidad's going to play direct. They're playing a bunch of young players. They're going to play direct. They always play direct. You can't play Michael Bradley by himself as a six. You can't. you got to have somebody else there to help win the second ball. You've got to have somebody else in there. And he didn't. And it, it cost him. And it just made no sense. And you played a bunch of guys who played a couple days before. It made no sense. It was arrogant. It was, we don't really have to take this game seriously. And you got punished for it. Bradley got the blame. I don't think it was all on Bradley. Um, but if 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 the idea and, and Bart's not saying it's about that game for Bradley, Bart's saying the whole the whole cycle, the whole campaign yeah. that time. I'd have to go back and watch it because I did not get that feeling during it. Um, but I think now that's got to be gone at this point. Yeah, unless <laughs> of course you're Nick, who is saying that Bart is correct and boo forever. Yes, and and I think that's silly and ridiculous. And Nick and I have had that conversation, and we will have it again, and it will happen many, many times <laughs> going forward. Um, I get it. In the first game, you see them. Yeah. I don't know why it's still a thing outside of it just being a fun thing to do. That's yeah. just me. So... Uh... Uh, Lot, there's lots of people who are on the Boo Bradley train. Oh, so, no, I mean, no, you no. Know, it's, Nick it's, and I think Bart has moved away from the train. I think Bart might have not started the train, but Bart might have been in, in the front of the train. And now he's yeah. maybe hanging off, off the side of the train or he got oh, okay. off at the last stop. I was going to say, I think that I think he might have uh, gotten off and he's kind of watching the train go off a little bit. But he's still on the he's still on the the. Uh, what the, what the hell do you call the thing when you're standing there? The the ramp, the runway. He's still on the runway and reserving the right to hop back on at any moment. He hasn't left the station entirely. He's still standing on the ramp to get back on if he wants to. I, I think the the thing that's put no, I I don't know. I don't think Bart's waiting to get back on the Boot Bradley train. That's not accurate. Um, I <laughs> Jason Nix is going in on Michael Bradley, geez, <laughs> and his dad too. Man, uh, his dad had nothing to do with that cycle, Jason Nix. Um, the part, I, I think this is why I get frustrated with it. Um, and we'll move on after this because we're rehashing old school drama here. Uh, the platform LB food bear tells you Thank that is you. the platform. word you were looking for. Thank you. Platform. I think the problem is people are using either a cycle or a game when it wasn't Michael Bradley's fault in Trinidad. It wasn't all his fault, but they're using that to diminish his whole career, which yeah. is not accurate. Not accurate at all. Um, and, and Bart's talking about that in the Twitch pitch, and I, I totally agree with him. Um, Bradley's rise into the national team, um, people started with the, the nonsense that he only got the opportunity because of his dad. No, he got the opportunity because he's one of the best players the United States has ever produced. There's no way around it. Uh, his time in Europe was a big deal. He was one of the first to go and not just go and be there and make up numbers, but to be significant. Um, in Serie A, he was significant. Um, the goal at the Azteca is one of the greatest goals in a U.S. shirt, period. Yep. Yep. Period. Um, Bradley's one of the best players the U.S. has ever produced. There, there's, I, I don't have any question about it. Um, top 10, easy, maybe higher. So don't let something that's not entirely his fault cloud your judgment of him as a player that's the the that's my issue with it and i feel like that started to happen um i don't think it's right uh bart says there's no reason to keep booing bradley won't be a national team player going forward and his career as a whole was good yeah i don't think he will be either i think he he's been beaten out now finally um his career has been outstanding uh I would say a first ballot U.S. Soccer Hall of Famer, but who knows with the way that thing goes. I actually think he still will be because of, of his presence. He should be. And he would be a first ballot Major League Soccer Hall of Famer if they had such a thing for what he's done at Toronto as well. Um, he's a legend in the game. Like it or not, and if we're still mad about not qualifying for 2018, you want to put it all on him, I don't think that's accurate. He's a legend. 
and he will hopefully get treated as such at some point. A uh, question from Ragamuffin for you. How do you feel about Bob Bradley at Swansea? Uh, he got, he got, uh, I'm trying to say this diplomatically. He Why are you trying to say it time. diplomatically? I, he, I got the short shaft. He wasn't given enough time. He was given, you know, he, he operated under the premise that he was going to be given a transfer window to improve things. He was not given that time, and I think he got shafted. So there, there's your there's your short version of it. I just think that I wish he had been given more time because now what you're going to see, rightly or wrongly because of that, is you're going to see any discussion of an American manager in the – whether it's – England or the European theater, they're always going to draw back to that Bob Bradley experience at Swansea and sit there and go, oh, American managers, we can't have them here as managers here in, in Europe or in England because of Bob Bradley. That's an unfair comparison. I just don't think Bradley was given enough time, but that's what the perception is going to be going forward, I think, for anyone in England who wants to you know, have an American as a manager. Anybody who says that... Um, is probably somebody who would say that, that Messi can't hack it in the Premier League. Oh. And you don't need to pay attention to their opinions because that's just wrong. Um, Bob Bradley didn't have time to prove anything at Swansea. Mm-mm, and and my issue with his time at Swansea is this. The communication between the front office, leadership of the club, ownership, whatever, and Bob was obviously not handled correctly because Bob Bradley did not manage that team like points, necessity, no questions asked. He was managing it like he was building Mm -hmm. something. He wasn't in Sam Allardyce mode of just survive. And I don't think you brought him in just to do that because that's not not what you're getting out of him. You're bringing him in to build. Mm Mm-hmm. And they didn't give him time to build. And and Captain says it sounds like FDB at Palace, which is a different scenario because of the time of season. But it, it's there's similarities, absolutely, yeah. because he mm-hmm. was not brought in just to survive and and do what Palace has done. He was brought in to change the way Palace played, and they couldn't handle it. He got less time than Bradley, but Bradley was mistreated at Swansea, in my opinion. Yeah. And anybody who tries to use that as, oh, like Americans can't coach in Europe and blah, blah, blah. Again, you, you have the opinion that Lionel Messi can't hack it in the Premier League. And, yes, the video is out there. Kevin from Charlotte, thank you for getting my blood pressure yeah. up this morning. Yeah. Uh, sharing that because it was really dumb. Mm-hmm. I, I, just, I, I don't have a better word. It's just dumb. And when the question comes up, and this was Richard Keyes who, who said this part, that Tells you all you need to know. Yeah. When the question was which player is is better, Messi or Ronaldo? Ronaldo, no question. Why? Nigel De Jong. Why? 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 Why are you saying that? Why? Not to say like it's a crazy opinion, because Cristiano Ronaldo is one of the greatest players ever, and you can argue he's better than Messi. Absolutely, there's things you can argue. Strictly arguing power is not arguing he's a better player than Lionel Messi. I will push back against that argument every single day of the week. Power is not what makes a great soccer player. It's not. I'm always going to go for the player like a Lionel Messi, who is crafty, who is tricky, mm-hmm. who does things that no one else can do. The reason why you can argue, if, if I want to go full debate class here and, and, and argue Cristiano Ronaldo as the better player than Lionel Messi, he won titles in England, I believe in Portugal as well, in Spain, in Italy. He has remade his game from being a crafty, tricky winger with about 75 step overs in two seconds, which probably Richard Keyes didn't like him then because he wasn't power. He did that and now has turned into one of the greatest number nines, just a true striker that the game's ever seen. That's impressive. He's an incredibly hard worker. I mean, his, 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 the physical side of his game now is absurd. Like, I give him a ton of credit. He, you can argue he's, one, he's the best player ever. You can argue that. I'm going to argue it's Messi because I think Messi's special. I think Messi's a, a unicorn almost in the way that he plays and the way he sees the game. That's personal opinion. Power 
is not the argument for Ronaldo being a better player. It's as inane as saying, Americans can't manage in Europe. See Mike, see Bob Bradley. See, see. No. Uh, see Jesse Marsh, first off. And he's in a, a system kind of club. And uh, that, is, that is a factor. But he's doing a great job. There will be more. I think Jim Curtin goes to manage in Europe at some point. There's my bold hot take of the day. Jim Curtin goes to manage in Europe at some point. I think that's where he wants to go. I think that it, whenever he leaves Philly, he will go either to the U.S. men's national team or he'll go to a European club. Um, more managers will go and work. Not, not the, the David Wagners, the not American-born. And I know we, we've got a few more of that, but you're going to see more American-born managers go work in Europe. And they're going to get that pushback. He's American. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. That's not true. Um, and to hold Bob Bradley accountable for that is is unfair and incorrect. Just like saying that the only reason Ronaldo is a better player is power. Jeez. Uh, I I saw that. I sound like Jeremy from Top Gear when I say power. I I don't know Jeremy from Top Gear. Sorry, I didn't get into that show. Um, okay, I'll take it. I, I just. I, I watched that clip and you know you just your head starts to hurt. It's like why? It's why? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're not you're you're leaving modifiers out, and I want to make sure. I, what I know, saying. I am. The no, 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 stop, stop. The why of Ronaldo Messi better player is that's a debate. I'm fine with that. Yeah, you're. I'm thinking. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Your mm-hmm. part that you're not understanding is that Messi would be a flop in the Premier yes. League. Okay, yes. I wanted to clarify because yes. you can argue Ronaldo's a better player. That, I'm not. That, yeah, I don't that, have a problem with that. That's always going to be part of the debate. But I'm and I'm Team Messi because I enjoy artistry and imagination and creativity and all those kinds of things. Not disputing Ronaldo having taken different aspects of his game and added them and become. Uh, a different player and having different skills as his career is engaged. And uh, it's absolutely amazing what he's done. I've just, I've gravitated toward the artistry section, but flopping in the premier league, you've got to be blanking, kidding me. Oh, yeah. my head started to hurt when I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, that's the bad take of the day. Oh my God. Um, or, and it'll get, or, or for them uh, Tuesday. Well, I said of the day. I mean, they'll have another bad take tomorrow, I'm sure, yes. because that's uh-huh. what that's the gimmick. I I get it. I think. Um, I hope it's a gimmick. I'm mm-hmm. maybe just trying to be nice. Uh, you got somebody to thank for their uh, patronage of the yes. Soccer Down Here Network. It is. Uh, they're not gimmickry. This is not a gimmick. This is accurate. Steve Apolinsky is the best. He is the bomb. Apolinsky and Associates LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH network. Ron Death and Serious Injury Attorneys, if this is a conversation that you need to have, one firm that you need to have it with, Apolinsky and Associates LLC, a couple different ways that you can have that conversation. You can shoot Steve an email directly, S-T-E-V-E, at aa-legal.com. You can get a free consultation by giving them a call at 404-377-9191, or you can go to the website, aa-legal.com hit enter the second you hit enter a pop-up window pop up pops up 24 7 365 and a quarter you want a conversation with someone at the other end of that pop-up window you can do it right that very second you have your questions answered recognized as legal elite by georgia trend magazine top 100 firms in this here state of georgia Wrongful Death and Serious Injury Matters, one place to get your questions answered. It is Apolinsky and Associates, LLC. The website is aa-legal.com. I think after my uh, tirade about power, Captain Ragamuffin's right. Should y'all change the Saturday morning show to the finesse hour from power hour? True. The creativity hour, yeah. yeah we're the gonna finesse to, hour. We're going to have to yeah. change it now that I've... Uh, 
completely ruined power. We have well, ruined unless, the word power. Richard Keys ruined the word power. Ricky. I mean, unless unless you sit there and it's the Saturday morning power hour or something like no, that. No, because then we just got to talk about like pace and power, and then we're we're not talking about the the fun things about the game. So yeah, that 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 might be retired this week. I got to think about this now. Oh wow, we have ruined the word power. It's true, Ricky. Well, no, no, the NWA with their studio show was in Well, NWA that's it. No, that's wrestling, John. You want power in wrestling. You're not at valuing um the 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 craftiness in wrestling as much, although it does get valued. Uh wrestling power is is accurate. Uh soccer power is important, but there are other things that are uh more important in my opinion. The brunch crunch, that's pretty good for a card. Well, <laughs> I kind of like that. Is, Abby with are intensity. We, are, we in, are we in the, the brunchy zone with the time that we're on the air? John, what time is the brunchy zone to you? More like 11, 12, somewhere. We're on from 10 to 11. Somewhere between like 11 and 1, not quite lunch, you know. 10 to 11 is the, the Saturday morning show. <laughs> I mean, I don't eat breakfast, so I'm kind of at a loss anyway. You said brunch. Yeah, well, if it's if it's the brunch bunch or whatever, the brunch crunch, brunch crunch, brunch bunch, all of the same. Just saying, I don't eat breakfast. I'm at a loss. I don't. I don't really. It's brunch. Okay, it's not breakfast. It's brunch. That's what, yeah, that's what you called it. It's the brunch crunch, the brunch bunch. Uh, <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, Walt Baxley says, Jim Curtin's been given plenty of time to build something. If he were to go to Europe, would they give him a long leash like Philly did? History says no. Well, no, it depends on where he goes. Um, and and burned with a good point, uh, Ernst Tanner is pretty well connected. So if that time mm-hmm. comes, then, yeah, he would be able to get to a club where he could grow. He would not need to go to a relegation-threatened club. No, he he would need to do the Jesse Marsh route. He would need to go to a smaller country, a smaller league, take a team, and have be given time to, to build. Um, the thing about Philly, and, and this is – the pushback I've had for a long time because there were people, I think there's still people in, in Philadelphia who don't rate Jim Curtin um, and rich, uh, rich ransom. I, I mean, you tell me, but I saw it last year. Like people, like, Oh, Curtin's no good. He's not going to get the job done. I, I thoroughly disagree. I don't think he's had the talent until very recently to get it done. Um, you've shocked a lot of people again, John, this, why is this a shock? You don't like breakfast. No, I don't eat breakfast, really, no. You don't eat breakfast. Mm-hmm. You don't like breakfast. You no, don't I didn't breakfast. say I didn't like breakfast. You did I will, say that. I will have, I thought I will have breakfast for dinner. But you won't have breakfast for breakfast? I will have breakfast for breakfast. Because um, traditionally, I have to go to work, and I don't have the time to get up and have breakfast and sit and have it and then get to work and get the day started. I'm, You know, the other day... The other day, to be to be perfectly honest with you, I was seriously hankering like Eggs Benedict with hash browns, and I was trying I'm to figure out. I'm shocked you'd eat Eggs Benedict, to be perfectly oh, Eggs honest. Eggs Benedict is, if you do Eggs Benedict right, it's awesome. I'm shocked. Eggs Benedict with a side of hash browns? Oh, my God. No, no, I, I, no, I, I know. I'm shocked that you would eat it. Why? Uh, have, have, you, have you ever listened to the show that we're on, John? And in your food takes? Yeah. I try not to, I don't try not to listen to the show while we're doing it. It sounds kind of counterproductive. That's a good try. Um, it's not really getting to the point here. Your, your, your food takes are very interesting to say the least. I mean, I, I can go there. There's a, a you know, give me a great eggs Benedict. I love those. Okay. Give me go to go to the silver skillet. I, I you know I would I love the corned beef hash plate at the silver skillet. But you don't like breakfast. No, but I have breakfast you, at atypical times. I'll have breakfast for lunch. I'll have breakfast for dinner. I won't have breakfast for breakfast because a I'm not a morning person. B at the same time, <laughs> once again, I, I don't have the time to have breakfast, and my day just goes ahead and starts. That's just how it is. Um. 
Okay, what was one of the my questions? Work day, my work day starts. And so I, it's Cap, like, Captain, and I, Captain says then wake up earlier, which is, no! is a valid thing to no, say. No, I am not a morning person, Captain. That's not going to happen. John, we've been doing a show at 9 o'clock for a long time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're not a morning person. You don't eat no. breakfast. No, I've never been a morning person. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when a show starts. I'm not a morning person. Okay. Why do you think I have these large cups of soda here for the show, sir? Well, I'd hope you're not eating breakfast during the show. That might be a little much. Um, that would be because then I'd probably, you know, for those watching on Twitch, they'd wonder, it's like, oh, my God, what are you eating and what is your food take? Yeah, because it's a it's a valid question. You, you've kind of mm-hmm. opened that door over the years to the uh, the food take questions. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, let me let me get caught up on the Twitch pitch here because sure. wow, <laughs> 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 you mention anything about food and things go off the rails. Thad, you're one hundred percent correct. Uh, do you like the Breakfast Club? The movie, of course. Of course. Okay, just checking. Just checking. Um. Smoke them up, Johnny. Mizano says uh, you pick the sweet breakfast items over the savory breakfast items. Is Eggs Benedict sweet? In general, you pick the sweet items because you eat your... Uh... <laughs> did, did you ever decide what it was? Was it a Danish or was it a turnover or was it somewhere in between? It's uh, that some other term that they gave it. We've got them upstairs, and so I'll bring it down tomorrow, and I'll show the box to everybody who's watching on Twitch. Okay, four card with a valid question, um, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna tweak it four card. If you were able to pick your ideal meal, I'm not gonna do the last meal thing because that's kind of ridiculous. If you could pick your 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 favorite thing to eat uh, for dinner tonight, what would it be? I'll well, see, but I had it last night though. That's uh, I did, I'm, did, did, what did you have last night? Then don't be silly. Well, I had I had pizza. Pizza is your favorite meal. No, spaghetti is my well, pasta is my favorite meal. Pasta, okay, with no salt, of course, right? Of course. So, pasta, your bad take on pasta with no mm-hmm. salt, yeah, is your favorite meal. When you say pasta, mm-hmm. what is on said pasta? Is your favorite meal? This is your favorite thing. You get to pick anything you want to eat to celebrate anything, and you're picking pasta. Give me a big honking plate of spaghetti and meatballs with a nice uh, with a nice meat sauce. Okay, that's somewhat respectable, except for the salted pasta. Um, <laughs> is breakfast too spicy for you, John? No, it's just no. it's okay. in the way. It's like okay. I got it's stuff to do. I got, I got a show to be on at nine o'clock. No, I understand. And it's... Yeah, totally. Uh, does Mountain Dew count as breakfast? Yes, it does count as breakfast. Okay. Yes. Um. Hash browns. Do you put salt on the hash browns? No. Uh, the eggs? No. Pepper. Just pepper on the eggs. Just pepper. Okay. If I think to, if I think about it. Okay. Just checking. Um, hmm. Bacon. How do you feel about bacon? I, I'm for it. You're for bacon. Okay. Yes. I'm okay. for bacon You're and I'm bacon. for sausage. All right. Um. Let's see. Uh, Ricky says, I can agree with John. I wake up for work, but I'm not, I am also not a morning person. Accurate. Absolutely. Uh, Pacine says, that's why the muffins are so gamey. They've been sitting around because you don't like to eat breakfast. True. The expiration date on the current cinnamon rolls in the kitchen is the third. So I might get under that deadline. It's the third? And it's the Ten, 29th? 10 slash three. Not About to say, okay. Three. Yeah. I was like, wow. Okay. Wow. That's, that's Damn. scary. I'm not. I'm not that psychotic when it comes to eating food in the kitchen. Uh, uh, Toto Dynamo says an Argentine breakfast. Uh, talking to Ragamuffin, uh, mate and a piece of bread or something. Okay. I, I I'm when I go mate and, and I've said it before and maybe I need somebody to help me out with this because I need to get a good gourd and bombilla if I'm mm-hmm. going to do the mate thing. I'm I'm yeah, ready absolutely. to do that instead of the the tea bags and the 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 cheap way of doing it. Um, I do need a little bit of sugar in my mate. I, I, I don't, it's a little too bitter for me. So I need to figure out the proper way to do all of this. Um, I do like, uh, an, an Argentine breakfast, um, cause I don't eat a, a big breakfast. I, I generally don't like to eat a big breakfast at all. I just want something small. Um, you need coffee according to uncle, no pockets. 
I'm not a coffee person because today is National Coffee Day, apparently, according to Chiefs coach Steve. I'm not a coffee person either. So I'm I've never been that. a coffee person. I've tried many times. I'm not. Um, Ragamuffin says your pasta, would it have ragu with your unsalted pasta? Prego, Newman's. I, I go back and forth. Ah, okay. That's, that's where I thought that was going to go. Um... Abby says, uh, give me some OJ with pulp. I do like the pulp in the OJ. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm on I team too. pulp. Uh, good bagel with cream cheese and lox. Yeah. It's not something cream. I go with often, but that, that's cream cheese. A, I like it's a good change of pace. You like the cream cheese? Cream cheese. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. Uh, Toto, Toto backs me up on this. He says, uh, lots of people put sugar or sweetener in their mate or orange peel, lemon peel, mint, or something to cut the bitterness. Huh. Orange peel sounds interesting. I'm, I'm intrigued by this, Toto. Uh, do, 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 um, okay. Yeah, yeah, we, we, Abby, we're, we're completely throwing this, uh, out of whack with our, our food conversation this morning. <laughs> food dead here. Uh, Daniel Price says, as a home chef, he's asking me if I like bland food. Salt brings out flavor and bacon is all salt, you know? That's accurate. But I don't put the salt on it myself. <laughs> so you, you pretend you don't know about it. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Fair enough. Ignorance is bliss. If I don't if I don't do the physical act of adding the salt, then I didn't add any salt. Fair enough. Four card said, "Is this a soccer show or a food show?" I don't know. Four card. Yes, I have no idea anymore. Nick Brawley with an interesting question. Okay, what breakfast food would I put down on Atlanta and DC? Well, we'll get the prediction later, but let's say your favorite breakfast food and you're putting it on a a pick that you is it it's the equivalent of your black velvet driving shoes lock of the week what would your breakfast food lock of the week be probably would be uh hmm something with hash browns or it might just be a big plate of hash browns a big plate of hash browns okay yeah Yeah. cool be a triple order of hash browns on atlanta how about that okay uh ricky says pulp is for psychos Loves us though, but we're psychos. That's yes. okay. That's that's cool. Um, Chiefs coach Steve says Hickory House breakfast is the best in Atlanta, and that is one I've not had. I'm I'm very intrigued, Steve. I, I might have old, to. How uh, many old Hickory houses exist? I don't know, but Steve, I'm going to have to uh, sample this. Um, okay, we've went so far off the rails. It's not even funny. Uh, we started with a train talk about the booing Michael Bradley conversation, then the train uh, went off the side of the mountain. All right, let's try to get caught up here. Toto bringing us back into the, the, the conversation. What? Uh, Mateo Bahamich, which we talked about from Instituto. Uh, the Dynamo tried to get him on an installment deal. Uh, I think they had to make a better offer. The president of Instituto said, yeah, we got another MLS team who's interested. Houston went back. It looks like it's done. Should be done. Uh, signed and done. Should be traveling to Houston next week. Now, I'm glad that Toto brought that up, the part about traveling to Houston next week. We're still waiting on Marcelino Moreno to arrive in Atlanta. Uh, Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. a reporter in Philadelphia at Crossing Broad, um, crossingbroad.com, wrote a story about Gonzalo Higuain. Gonzalo Higuain reportedly, well, not reportedly, because he came to the United States. Uh, Jorge Moss took a picture with him at the airport, so he was here. He did his individual training during his quarantine time, the 10 days, coming into the country, coming into the league. He trained on his own. Then, reportedly, he went back, left the country to get his P1 visa. Then, came back. And no, Ragamuffin, this is not a bridge to get to more food conversation talking about Gonzalo Higuain. But that is a very good line, sir. (laughs) Yes, Um, that's the line of the day. Higuain went to get his P1 and came back and didn't have to do the 10 days again. And he played this weekend, and he skied a penalty, and he was mocked. Um, huh? That's not supposed to happen. That's not how any of this has happened. We also had the situation with Ricardo Pepe going from MLS to play in Greenville with North Texas to going back to play in MLS with no 10 days. Uh... 
I'm assuming that Houston is going to have Bahamich not come into the country until he gets his visa. I'm assuming Marcelino Moreno is not going to come into the country until he gets his visa. So he doesn't have to go back because they're supposed to miss 10 days when they leave and come back. I'm assuming that both of these clubs have planned things because of the rules, which are obviously not being followed. And what? Uh, feels like Miami got around things a little bit here. Pepe's a, a different bucket of the same conversation about moving from USL to MLS, which Atlanta has talked about as well, that they would have liked to have done they haven't been able to do because of protocols. Well, Dallas did it, so... Did Dallas just say, screw it, we don't care, we're going to do this? And MLS said, yeah, that's fine. And USL said, yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And it's affecting the way your, your strategies are coming in. Um, Byrne says, I think the issue is that the quarantine rules are dependent on the state. That's not it. It's not, a, it's not that issue. Because there is that. But MLS allegedly had a rule that you had a 10-day period when you came into the MLS protocols that you couldn't train with the team because Iguain didn't, and that was discussed. He didn't train with the team. He trained separately during that 10-day period. Blaise Matuidi did the same thing. But that's supposed to reset when you leave because that was part of the conversation with the players going to play in South American qualifiers. And this Uncle No Pocket says the longer it takes Moreno to get here, the longer we'll have to wait for his quarantine. When is he set to arrive? We could use the help. And that's the problem. Is Iguain came, did his quarantine, then left, got his visa, then came back, and they said, no, you don't have to do a second quarantine. You're good. That's not what the rules have been done so far. So now you have teams that are planning things based off the rules, but you have teams who are not following the rules. And it's it's not right. It's an issue. I can't wait to see where this goes. Because, one, I, I don't know why this isn't being talked about in a larger national sense. Um, full credit to CrossingBroad.com for the article. But uh, why is Miami not getting called out on this? And why did, why did it take, you know, because I didn't see it either. Why did it, it take our listeners to talk about the Ricardo Pepe situation on the USL movement? Yeah, Chris Ashley gets boatloads of credit there. Yeah, I mean, and and I, I want to be really clear in that. I don't have a problem with him playing for North Texas. That wasn't my issue. It was coming back to MLS two days later after yeah. playing for North Texas. That's not yeah. supposed to be part of the protocols. Yeah. So it's not right. Something's off here. Mm -hmm. And if you could do what Miami reportedly did, which was Higuain comes, he does his 10 days, the clock starts, then I guess it's okay to leave to go get your visa if they yeah. put you on a charter flight and you somehow don't get near any other human contact, yeah. which is impossible because you're picking something up, um, and then come back, that that doesn't count as leaving the leak, except it does, but they're saying it doesn't. Then Houston, Atlanta, any other team in the situation should – Bring the player in as quick as they can on whatever visa they can get them into the country on. Do the 10 days so then you're good to go and then yep. go get your visa when it's ready and come back and play. That's what Miami did. And that's not what they should have been able to do according to the protocols. What Dallas did with Pepe is not what they should have been able to do according to the protocols. So are we just not following the rules anymore and just you just don't do it, and then teams who have been doing it are like, hey. Mm -hmm. that's, I get that this stuff is complicated. I get that this stuff has been fluid and changing a lot. That's fine. But MLS has to be consistent with this. Yeah. Bart says, are Miami the new Galaxy? Able to not follow the rules so long as it deals with a star player. Well, the Galaxy last year with their uh, Christian Pavone loan that he yes. wasn't a designated player, except he was, but he wasn't, Somehow, mm -hmm. um, they still do it. So yeah. uh, the only thing the Galaxy got pushed back on was where they tried to be so egregious with it that they wanted to literally have four designated players on the roster and just say they shouldn't. Yeah. Um, 
on Giovanni Dos Santos, and the league finally said, "No, you you have to you have to take care of this." And they did. They had to buy him out, uh, but they didn't want to. The Pavone thing, they were able to finesse it to make sure that he was a on loan for the first year until you had a designated player slot. Uh, Mezzano says, My, regarding Miami, when MLS changes the rules to allow you to play in MLS, then name their rule after you. You don't think they will bend the rules when you are an owner of a team. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be a little nicer on that one because MLS gained from the Beckham designated player rule. It was a designated player rule. Everybody else called it the Beckham rule. MLS did. Yeah. Um, they gained from opening that up. Uh, that was a good move, and it needed to happen. So I'm not going to hate on that. But are they giving some leniency here in this situation? Uh, yeah, it looks it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe these protocols about 10 days and coming into the league and movement between MLS and USL, I don't think that was ever like actually published in rules and regs. Which it needed to be, because we've all been trying to figure this out the whole time. Uh, Byrne says this stinks, because sticking to the rules cost Atlanta United two its season. It cost George Campbell games. It cost Lawrence White games. It cost Tyler Wolf games. Uh, yeah. And I think everybody got worked up about Eric Lopez in the situation, and I think tried to throw blame at Atlanta United's front office, as that is the narrative these days. But go back and listen to what Carlos Bocanegra said. Um, I think the first time he talked about it in detail, he wasn't happy. He was frustrated. I think because they were told about how things could go, they made the signing, and then that changed. And they weren't allowed to do what they wanted to do, which was to have Eric Lopez play with the first team. And I don't think it was purely Open Cup and, and CONCACAF games. I think they were given other assurances or other options and then that was taken away. And what's frustrating is then when Dallas just does what they do with Pepe, which wasn't supposed to be able to happen, uh, Atlanta United too, and many other second teams could have benefited from that. And what Argentina's doing with Higuain, I mean, they accelerated the process, and they shouldn't have been able to do that, not according to the rules as we've understood them. So, um, Long term, yeah, and I agree with Abby. Like Atlanta United too got players, you know, able to play, and and young kids got more time because of it. I mean, you'll you you made it work in terms of the overall benefit, but you would have been more successful, and you would have got Campbell games this year, yeah, which is a big one. You would have got Wyke more games. You would have got Wolf more games, and, and those three would have absolutely played games with the twos this year. So, uh, it's 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 pretty frustrating. And it's pretty annoying, and I don't understand it. And this is where you need a little more transparency out of it on the MLS side. It This needs to be explained. Um, because I think it's kind of obvious that some teams have tried to follow what they think the rule is, and others have done it differently, and there, there shouldn't be confusion. There should not be any confusion about this. Uh, let's see. Rich Ransom says, you know MLS DP superstars don't have to follow the rules. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, then Marcelino Moreno should have been able to come into the country and start his quarantine and sit his 10 days while he's waiting on his P1 visa because he's going to be a DP superstar. Yep. Uh, he's not Gonzalo Higuain, but he should have been able to do that, and that would have accelerated it instead of waiting on the P1 visa to come into the country so then he could do his 10 days. Like The rules seem to imply that's the way it's supposed to go. But if you're somebody else, I guess you can do something else. I guess. I don't know. Uh, AUFC Addict. Atlanta United FFE on Twitter. What up, Addict? Uh, Watching All or Nothing. Awesome! With three exclamation points. Thanks for the tip. But why are they bleeping words like (laughs) uh, effing hell is left alone? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, why are they bleeping words but effing hell is left alone? I think the I think we figured out what the only word that they bleeped was. He's, uh, I don't know. He he said some different things that got bleeped. I think. I don't think it was the same thing that got bleeped multiple times. Uh, Addict says, "I love it, but if that isn't bleeped, why bother with anything else?" Uh, to be honest, my eight year old noticed, not me. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> it didn't make a lot of sense to me either. If you're going to go all the way, go all the way. And uh, Addict also says, in watching All or Nothing, I feel like I'm watching Atlanta United. I see a lot of parallels. The injury situation is uh, is an absolute here. Um, 
you know, Stephen Glass and Jose Mourinho, I think, are, are very different people in the way that they they see the game. They're different people in terms of their you know experience level. So that part separate, but the injuries and battling it and trying to figure out how to field a team uh, with injuries, yeah, that part's absolutely accurate. And just the the walking wounded that Tottenham had at different points last season and what maybe could be happening this season. Um, yeah, it's, it's brutal. Uh, I'm waiting to see today. The reports are for the Tottenham Chelsea match in the gummy bear cup, the Carabao cup that Tottenham has to field a, a team of a bunch of young guys. Well, Deli Ali wasn't part of the team over the weekend. He's not part of the team today. Is he going to be part of the Europa league team on Thursday? If he's not, they got to move him on. I mean, his his agent has to be like saying, "Look, it's time to go. The window closes Monday at five. He's not going to be here at five o'clock." Yeah, um, he's got to be gone, right? He's got to. Yeah, be. yeah. Uh, Chelsea right now minus one forty five. Tottenham a plus three fifty eight, uh, and your draws a plus three twenty six. You are an incredible degenerate gambler or you feel really really good about something to be betting on the Carabao Cup during this time of the season when managers are like <laughs> we want no part of this thing don't waste your time well, or your what was the boxes. number that I saw was it 20 different lineups that Frank Lampard has put out in his 41 Premier League matches so far hmm I haven't seen that um that's a lot it's a lot of rotation but mm-hmm. it's not crazy when you have that much talent because you got to keep everybody getting games that part's true uh lots of debating about the bleeping and and what should be bleeping and and how should things be bleeped and yeah very very interesting i don't have the answer to it Uh, i do like the conversation going on the twitch pitch though i'm 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 entertained by it at least yeah uh michael had a couple of other points uh in in air in uh airline conversations it's pronounced cutter airways and he says which is their domestic yeah so so if they're pronouncing it that way that's that's pretty accurate so going back to it, I, I had went down that road and started calling it that, and everybody was still going uh, the other way around. So now I feel justified. It, it is, and, and Shiva, I believe, I have not heard it yet because you know we're, we're kind of doing this. Uh, Shiva has posted a voice tweet with the proper pronunciation. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and I'm going to go check that, and I'm going to try to get it right. So I want to, I want to get it right. Uh, thank you for this conversation. This was good because I was very confused by it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if if the airline's pronouncing it that way, that would be a lot to go on completely. Yeah. And then uh, Michael says that you're right. The last World Cup qualifying and coaching decisions are clouding his viewpoint. That was so disappointing. <laughs> was. Then the Robinson episode. I just want yeah. the U.S. to be competitive on the world stage when we aren't. I get really negative on the whole U.S. soccer organization. Thank you. The, no, yeah, you could go because Michael said the team was a, a, a disaster. Was that the word? Uh, it's it's it, close enough. No, 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 no. It's all good. Don't waste your time. It's all good. Somewhere in that ballpark, yes, I think it's fair. Okay. Um, the team is not a disaster. If you want to talk about the federation, I think disaster is harsh. But that's a whole other topic that is not exactly a good one right now. Um, they got work to do. They got a lot of work to do. Uh, they got work to do on the referee side. They got work to do on referee development, and that's something they have never put the work into on a on a real regular basis, and that has to change. Um, if they can put it in with pro, and pro is working on developing the professional referees, well, that needs to be more intertwined with the state associations who are developing referees. Like th- There has to be a program. I just feel like right now it is... People going out and seeing referees work and like, yeah, I like you. Yeah, I like you. Okay, cool. You're going to come over here and get this game. And there's not really development like you see players get developed and coaches get developed. The Federation has to put resources to that. And it's hard right now because resources are scarce. And they've got a lot of other issues they got to battle and fix and deal with because there's been poor leadership in the Federation for way too long. Um, I don't know if the current leadership is poor. I don't think it's fair to put the previous problems on them. Um, I do feel like they're trying to make the right changes, but they got a lot of things to work on. Um, I don't envy Cindy Parlo Cohn's job right now and all the things that she's got to deal with as the, the president of the Federation. But I do feel like she's trying to address a lot of the problems. So let's give her a little bit of time. 
Uh, but big picture stuff, yeah, I'll go more disaster on big picture stuff with the Federation than just the men's national team right now because I do like the talent coming through. Uh, and then John Nason, with our discussion where my head hurt from Keys and Gray this morning, he says uh-huh. that uh, we're all speculating until Messi actually heads to the EPL, though. Previous success leans heavily toward continuing that path, but I don't think we'll ever know for sure he's not heading to England, in my humble opinion. Who said this? Uh, John Nason. John, the thing I would push back on, that, like, he's older now. So, I mean, would Messi in his prime have been different? Yes, he would have. But I'm not pushing back on he would score the same number of goals at Barcelona that he would at Manchester City. I'm not even going there. I'm saying that he would. there is no way possible that he would be a flop in England. Yeah. Zero. It is impossible for Lionel Messi to go to England and not do well. How well? Different conversation. Also at a different age now. But the idea that he would be a flop because he doesn't have power is a, a horrendously bad take. Horrendously bad. Nothing to base that on except a bias against players who don't have power. And, and players who are creative and, and players who might not be the biggest and players who can dribble past people and players who can solve problems that nobody else can. There's, for some reason, a bias against players like that. And I'm going to push back on it whenever I, I see it because I think it's wrong. We need to embrace those players, especially in this country and in England too. Those players need to be embraced. Those players need mm-hmm. to be celebrated. It does not need to just be Work rate, power, pace, all this stuff. No, it needs to be skill. It needs to be talent. It needs to be creativity. These are things that need to be celebrated. You need fast players. You need mm-hmm. strong players. You need that too. But that can't be the only thing that's celebrated in the game. And Lionel Messi would go to the Premier League and score goals. There's no mm-hmm. question about it. A flop? No. Um, yeah, there's a reason why... Uh, those two are not commenting on the Premier League anymore because there you go. Um, That's all you need to know. Uh, Conversation about MLS USL. Toto Dynamo chimes in and says, lots of young MLS players have suffered from not being able to go to USL on loan because they would not be available for the rest of the season in their MLS teams, the the COVID protocols. That's what Tab Ramos said a few weeks ago. Um, That's what's been said here too. Um, now and, and Toto says, even though that's not what the rules say, I believe. Now, that's what managers have said. I don't think Tab, and I don't think Glassy, and I don't think... I, I want to say Carlos Bocanegra spoke on this as well. I might be wrong on that. I know it's been talked about that you couldn't move players back and forth. And, and Tab said it, and other teams have said it too. But Dallas just did. And yeah. that's what's, what's frustrating. Um, Byrne agrees and says it, it costs the league a whole lot of money. Losing the development time for young talent, it was very upsetting, and whoever came up with that rule messed up big time. There were other ways to solve the issue. Um, and Burns says increased testing. There, there should have been, and this is trying to solve a problem that I, is pretty much already done at this point, there should have been the option if second teams wanted to take advantage of players moving back and forth. The option should have been that they would test on the MLS protocols three times a week, and yep. follow all of the MLS protocols for players to be able to move freely. And if they didn't want to do that, then they'd operate on the USL protocols, which was once a week testing. Right. They could have opted in to the increased testing to be able to move back and forth. It sounds like that wasn't an option. Yeah. But it also sounds like Dallas just either you know did something that nobody else thought they could do, or they just did it and nobody noticed it. Or they just did it and they didn't care. So you had two players this weekend play that did not follow the 10-day re-entry to MLS or entry to MLS protocol because we're not making this up. This was part of the conversation with MLS teams saying they didn't want players to go to South American qualifiers this weekend when that came up about coming back and missing 10 days. That was part of the conversation from a lot of different people. So this 10-day thing wasn't imaginary. And is it imaginary? (laughs) Like, I don't know. Arbitrary. 
I don't know. I, we don't. We have no idea. Like that's we don't understand it because the league hasn't been clear about it to the point that teams don't understand it. Because teams and Toto mentions Top Ramos. We've heard it here. Didn't think you could move back and forth freely. But Dallas just did it. And then the Higuain thing is a whole other topic that yeah. gets into how you bring players into the league. So uh, it's baffling. They should have had the opportunity to, to opt in to the MLS protocol. And if they want to pay for it, then they pay for it. And that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bart is now uh, chanting, power football Atlanta United. Please, let's not be power team. Let's be, uh, let's be a skilled team. Let's be a, a, a talent team. Let's, let's be a technical team. Um, we need some power. Yeah, we need it. It's cool. We need a little bit of that. But the the team can't be judged and based off of it, please. Please, 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 please. Poor five, four. Uh Daniel Price uh, says, my worry with Messi going into England, he'll just be cut down and he'll be called out for not being physical or powerful enough. No, he will be cut out for that. And it'll be the people who uh, should follow the, the, the two gentlemen who are no longer calling the Premier League. Uh, games and studio shows. Um, if that's the mentality, is that he's not powerful enough and he's he's not strong enough and all that that he can't play here, then they should go and and go somewhere else because they need to watch the league, which the league does have an emphasis on pace and power. That's that's accurate. That's accurate. There's nothing wrong with that. But to say a player like Lionel Messi can't find his way into that, come on, get out of here, get out, like stop, get out. Uh, Burned has a good point. What would we talk about if it wasn't for English pundits' bad takes? We could find some things. Oh, yeah. John's food takes, for, for one. Um, Actually. We could. But, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Um, pace and power is not a bad thing, but it can't be the only thing. And England will benefit when you don't have the constant refrains of it. He will get fouled a lot in England because it is a more physical game. Uh, he's been fouled plenty in La Liga. It, it's it's pretty physical too, so he'll be okay. He, he's a tough guy, um, but no, that's not a reason why he shouldn't be able to go there, and that's not a reason why he wouldn't be successful there. I thoroughly disagree. Uh, we got uh, Copa Libertadores tonight. We do have Copa Libertadores tonight, and Boca Juniors is playing at La Bombonera for the first time uh, since the pandemic, and it's not the first time they've played behind closed doors there. They have had fans banned from the stadium before for matches. It might be the first time in the Libertadores that they are. They're breaking out a uh, brand new all-yellow kit that celebrates the history of La Bombonera. Uh, It's a pretty sweet kit, actually. I have to give Boca some credit on that. That's one of the games tonight. Um, we have six. Okay, we got six games tonight. You can watch all of them on Fanatis or on BN Sports if you get that through another carrier. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. That's how you can sign up on Fanatis. You, you're really big with the uh, hand motions today. Well, I always do the slash when you're doing the FNTZ. You're doing the slash. You're doing the, the waving. You're doing the, uh, the power. I mean, man. It's a lot. You're getting a workout today. It's good. I am. Um, match day five. You can watch it on Fanatis. You can sign up for the free trial if you haven't already. Uh, that helps the show through that link. You can sign up for a subscription. Um, you can add the Brasilero pack or the Right Italia pack. That helps the show. Uh, <laughs> Rope says, if Messi can survive Sergio Ramos. That's accurate. <laughs> That's yeah. very good. Uh, match day five starts at 6.15. Two games at 6.15. You've got Gramio and Universidad Católica. And you've got Peñarol and Colo Colo. I'll be watching Peñarol and Colo Colo. One, Carlos Carmona could be starting for Colo Colo. Uh, two, that could be a very gritty game. That could be an interesting one. It, it, it looks like the more interesting match to me. What do the odds makers have to say about these? Gremio, minus 161. Catolica, plus 437. These are yeah. practically identical right now. Yeah, Gremio, uh, sure your sure draw, did. plus 287. Penarola, minus 164. Colo Colo, a plus 438. And your draw in the composite, a plus 292. I'm, I'm taking the the Humex. Uh, I'm going to go actually go Peach because I like the Peach the best. I'm going to take the Humex Peach and go to Colo Colo. Okay. I, I don't trust Penarola at all right now. 
Um, that's a huge number for Colo Colo. Now, Colo Colo had to come from behind and beat them in Chile last time around. Colo Colo is level on points with Jorge Wilstermann on six in Group C. Peña rolls on three. Um, Atletico Paranaense is on nine. Um, Colo Colo needs the win badly. Peña roll does too, but I just think Colo Colo is a better team. Neither one's had a good year. Uh, Colo Colo has only won one time since the restart, and that was against Peñarol. Peñarol fired Diego Forlan. Neither team's in a good place. I think there will be lots of power on display and lots of people getting kicked and uh, elbowed and forearmed, and there will be lots of consternation, yelling, and, and lots of things, uh, lots of hand signals, lots of, lots of stuff. But I think Colo Colo finds a way to win it. So that's where my Humex juice box is going in that one. 8.30, we got four games. Uh, Paranaense and Jorge Wilstermann. Jorge Wilstermann, the Bolivians, have to play their last two games on the road. That's going to be a challenge. Um, America de Cali is hosting Internacional. Boca hosting Libertad and Tito Vialba. Liga de Quito is hosting Binacional, who has not returned our calls. No, damn it. Wow. Look at John. He's fired up about Binacional. I wanted... Be Nacional gear, you reach out to them, you send a DM to their Facebook page when all of this stuff started with the steroided Pumas, and the the amount of response that I have gotten from Be Nacional on my Facebook and my uh, my DMs, zero. It's a yep. Blutarski. 0.0 response. Yep. Uh, I think it's going to be 0.0 response for them in Ecuador tonight, too. Uh, Liga de Quito is playing very, very well. That should be a blowout. Boca should be able to handle Libertad. Um, the game I'll be watching the closest at 830 is the America de Cali and Internacional game. That's going to be my primary. Uh, what are the juice makers saying? Uh, America de Cali, plus 197. Internacional, plus 150. And Ooh. your draw, plus 211. Paranaense, minus 294. Jorge Wilstermann, plus 776. Nick went draws. with that one. I'm not trusting it. And then uh, draws a plus 398. Nah. Boca, minus 312. Okay. Libertad, plus 846. Feels about right. Not trusting and, it. I think Nick went with Libertad, too. Yeah, and your draws a plus 400. And now it's name that number with uh, it, LDU. Was this the, the, the plus 3,000 one for Binacino? Yeah, last night. It has come down some. Ah, okay. Because the action, I guess, when they saw that number, that has Yeah, kind of people said, I got, I got some spare juice boxes. Uh, keep uh, LDU minus 2,000. Binacional a plus 2840, down from a plus 3300 uh, last night during soccer over there, and your draws a plus 1247. It'll be a blowout. Um I'll be on Peñero, Colo Colo, and America de Cali hosting Internacional. Those will be my games tonight. Did we get picks from Mataflow? Uh, no, we did not get the Mataflow. Uh, El Mataflow! Dude. Somebody put out the El Mataflow bat signal. Um, come yeah, on, my need, friend. We need the uh, trademark selections from El Mataflow. We'll, we'll share them when we get them. Um, they'll, they'll go up on the Twitter account, so make sure you follow following at soccer down here. A uh, couple things as we clo- get closer to wrapping up. You guys got final questions. Throw them our way. It's The, the show's been off the rails for a while, so wherever you want to take it, go for it. Uh, we do still have some Marcelino Moreno scarves. They are going steadily. Um, we're getting down to 40-ish left. Uh, actually, yeah, I think we're right at 40 right now. Um, $25. You can send us a message. We'll get you taken care of. Uh, we will need your address to ship it. They should be here very, very soon. And all the proceeds, all the proceeds, the only thing, we're, we're, we're paying for the scarves to get made, and we're paying to get them out to people. And everything else is going to the school at Atletica uh, Palmira, the soccer school for four- to eight-year-olds that they named after their greatest player they've ever produced, Marcelino Moreno. So excited to get them as much money as we can to help the next generation of Marcelino Moreno's. I'm excited for you guys just jumping on board with us and helping us out with that. Thank you for the response to it. And please share it. We're, we're trying to get rid of all of these scarves, sell them, and make as big of a donation as we possibly can. So please spread the word if you can. Uh, let people know. And they're going fast. We're, I think we're going to be out of them hopefully by the middle of next week. Uh, maybe by the end of this week if, if the response is still good. What do we have on the Twitters that we have not touched on? Uh, efforting quickly. Now that letting it recycle here. 
Uh, let's see. Scrolling down, scrolling down. I think we're actually caught up on the Twitters. We, I think we are. Yeah, we, we are actually caught up on the Twitters. Okay. We, we're good to go. Yeah, we are actually good to go off of the Twitters. Uh, we had Jason Nix say, um, or sorry, Ricky Ricardo started it. Glad to know that Nashville does not train where the Titans do, given today's news. Yeah. Um, Titans had three new player positives, five new personnel positives. Um, that is Tom Pelissero and Mike Garfolo. Um, both Titans and Vikings, who hosted them on Sunday, will suspend in-person club activity starting today. Uh, Nick said that the Vikings close their facilities as well. Um, it doesn't affect Nashville SC. They don't train where Tennessee Titans do, and the game was in Minnesota, so there's not even that concern, which is, is small. And, you know, it's it's like we're going to see it at some point, I would assume, just because players are going to hang around after a game and, and talk, and you're going to see some transmission from two separate teams. We haven't seen it yet. And there's nothing to show that it would happen during a game. Now, American football is a little different, and we haven't seen the same studies about players being around one another for a period of time in a game. And I can't believe they haven't done that. I know. With That's all the of the academic to. institutions who are involved in American football and making a lot of money off of it, to not have a study about how much time players are spending around players from an opposing team in a game is an embarrassment. Uh, you have those studies in soccer, and you're not around players for an extended period of time to where the risk goes up. 15 minutes is kind of that that mark, and you're not around a player for 15 minutes um, inside of the six feet and without a mask on. It doesn't happen in a soccer match. In a football game, I don't know. But they have to test the other team out of caution. There's not been a, a situation with transfer from one team to another in American football yet that I know of at the high school, college, or pro level. No. Um, transmissions have been inside a team yes, and not from one team to another. That could always change, but we've seen these events go on with games and American football is different. That's the thing to me. Uh, baseball is very different. That, that baseball, I have hardly any concern about that happening. Basketball and soccer, more concern, although there are studies to say that it is not a major concern. It is not a major risk factor. American football, I don't know. Uh, like rugby, I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. Those I would have more questions based off the nature of the sport. So we'll see. Uh, Sean Vergara says, "Do you think Barco is holding out?" No, I don't think so mm-hmm. at all. Um, when you hold out, you don't do it silently because uh, it, you're not accomplishing anything. Um, because the whole point is to make it clear why you're holding out. So I, I don't think so. Uh, there's been talk that he's waiting on a move. There hasn't been talk out in other places about a move that is imminent. It hasn't come out of Argentina, where obviously I think his agent would be vocal. Um, Hasn't happened there. Hasn't come out of Spain. Hasn't come out of Italy yet. Although some of the clubs that have been mentioned are linked to sales that could be going down sometime soon. If money comes in, maybe things heat back up. I don't know. Maybe they've been hot and we just haven't heard about it. That's also possible. But I don't think that's the, the issue. Um, we'll go back to what Stephen Glass said after the match on Sunday. Barco has been day to day. Barco has trained with the full team, and after training with the full team, he hasn't felt right, and he's went back to the. I think they called it modified training. That's the training on the side. I think is the common term that uh, yeah. our, our good friends who are no longer involved in the Premier League would use. Yeah. Um, training on the side. It's it's not training fully with the team. You're working with the training staff. You're you're trying to find out what's wrong and and what you can do to fix it. We saw it in All or Nothing too. I mean, you see that sort of thing uh, when Harry Kane and Son came back into the team. They weren't training with the team. Sometimes players go back and forth when it, they're not you know, it's not right, and that's what's happening right now with Barco. That is what Stephen Glass said after the game. That's where we're at. If he's not ready to play and feel fine while playing and feel fine after playing, you're not going to risk injury with him because he is an asset and he could be an asset right now. He could be an asset in the next window, but you're not going to risk injury with him if it's not right. I don't think he's holding out. There's nothing to go on with that except for people wanting to start drama and start speculation. He's not putting anything on his Instagram about it. He's not starting anything with it. I don't know why anybody else is. And I 
don't think it's right. I don't think it's right at all. Um, it is a guessing game, and you're questioning somebody's integrity in that. You're questioning multiple people's integrity, and that's not right. I just don't, I don't, I don't like that at all. Uh, Badgermon says, how did Jorge Wilstermann get its name? As a world history teacher, I'm familiar with Bernardo Higgins and SA uh, revolutionaries, but I've never heard of Jorge Wilstermann. We actually went down this uh, rabbit hole. Um, I think it was on a soccer over there show. Yeah. And he is an aviator from Bolivia, and they named the club after him. Um, I'm getting the story now. So a group of employees of Lloyd uh, Ario Boliviano met to form a football club in 1949 that would be identified with the company and become the pride of its workers. And this is from Wikipedia, but, you know, hey, it, it gets yeah. us at least started here. Yeah. Uh, after two hours of debate, they founded the club with the name San Jose de la Banda, in tribute to the area and the airport in Cochabamba. Uh, they proceeded to the election of the board, and they appointed a club president. They picked blue and white as the team colors. Um, after the death of the company's first commercial pilot in Bolivia, Jorge Wilstermann, the name of the club was changed. Um, in 1953, the captain of the team, uh, the manager of the company, uh, and the partner of the deceased suggested that both the airport and the team bear the name of that pilot who had been very dear to the institution. So that's where the name came from. Uh, ten minutes ago, Scott Parker, current manager at Fulham, says he was disappointed owner Tony Khan apologized for Fulham's performance in a tweet following Monday's defeat at home to Aston Villa. Why? Uh, I think, obviously, I said it last night, people have the platform, you own a football club, you can decide how you want to communicate or send a message out. It's not something I agree with, it's not helpful from that sense, but like I said, that's down to the owner and how he sees it. There's one thing that I'm disappointed with, and that's how he's actually apologizing for the performance, and that is something that I don't agree with and he shouldn't have. The performance last night was a good performance, which was a group of players who've done everything they can, worked tirelessly from the first minute to the 95th, from 3-0 down, they were still trying to work as much as they can to try to get us back in the game, and for that, I don't agree with him. Parker's not handling this right, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know why he went down that road. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe he got things out of context. I don't know, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, he didn't question the effort. He, he questioned the performance. Um, and he said the reason for the performance was because they haven't been able to get the players and they want to get. Um, Parker could be seen as defending his players, which is a smart thing for a manager to do. I don't think he's helping clarify the situation, though. I think he's making it muddier. That's not good. Yeah. That Parker doesn't help says, anything. Yeah, Parker says, I'll be the first to have an issue with my squad and my team and my players if I felt that that was something which needed to be criticized. So I don't have so I have an issue with that, and obviously that's something which I don't agree with. The other bits, it is what it is, and I think we understand our challenges this year, and the rest is noise. End quote. Uh, this is going to be made something. Um, this will be a talking point for a while, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, it shouldn't be. I, Parker's throwing gasoline on something that doesn't need it. That's yeah. just that's. E. I, I don't like that. We'll see what happens. Um, it feels like he's creating something out of nothing, to be perfectly honest. Um, Bart wants to know, how do we petition AMBSE slash Mercedes-Benz Stadium to bid to host the 2021 Gold Cup? I don't know the process for that, um, because I think it could involve the Georgia World Congress Center as well. Um, I would assume for an event like that, it would involve the Atlanta Sports Council. That's where I would start. Because yeah. I know the Sports Council is the one that is either the spokespeople or leading the bid for the 26th World Cup. Um, uh, Dan Corso has yes. been the person who has spoken on the record about the 26th World Cup bid. That would be where to start. And I know they're on social media channels. Um, they have a website. That would be the group to start with. Because for an event, a big event, um, you're going to have to tie in hotel. You're going to have to tie in all kinds of other aspects to it. So the Atlanta Sports Council would be who you're petitioning. And uh, do it. Because I'd love to see the 21 Gold Cup games be here. I'd love to see that. The 
previous Gold Cup editions that were here were primarily because Jeffrey Webb, the president of CONCACAF at the time, really liked Atlanta, had homes here, had property here, uh, married a woman from Atlanta. He was also uh, putting money that he should not have had into things in the Atlanta area, so maybe he was a little biased <laughs> in wanting things to be in Atlanta. He said he wanted a Gold Cup final to be in Atlanta at some point. I hope that that, is, that stuff is not being held against Atlanta because Atlanta had nothing to do with Jeffrey Webb being Jeffrey Webb and doing yes. what he did to get banned and get fired and potentially go to jail. Um, so I hope Atlanta gets Gold Cup games. They absolutely should. But the Sports Council would be the, the group to start with there. Uh, they would be the ones that would make it happen because they'd tie all the other pieces together. Uh, Badgermon's making it clear that he's not playing hooky uh, from his teaching duties. It is fall break. Oh, no. No, no. Just wanted to make sure. No, that's good. No, no, no. Um, lots of Barco mystery talk. Um, Uncle says, what are the juice boxes on Barco playing? It's way too early to tell. And we're not seeing training. So, yeah. I mean, you're just throwing juice box numbers out to, to do it. It depends on who you talk to because there are people who are trying to create a narrative out of it that have nothing to go on. So they would probably put the juice box numbers very high on not playing. I'm 50-50 right now because that's where it sounds like it is. Um, do, 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 do. Side session Mizano uses for the, uh, the training yes. on the side. That's another yeah. one. Yes. Uh, Captain Ragamuffin likes bacon on the side. I do too. Nothing wrong with that. I can support this. With some uh, scrambled eggs to go with, yeah. Um, Jason Nick says, yeah, I don't get the... The the front office is lying to us about Barco takes. I don't either. Uh, I'm with Shiva. Barco's worth a lot more than some people think. That's unquestionable to me. Um, I don't think you're going to get what you hoped you would get at the beginning of the year for Barco because of the way the market's changed. But yeah, you're going to get a return. And he will be, I think, behind Almiron as the largest confirmed, like full at the time, uh, transfer outside of MLS. Uh, Davies might surpass um, both of these. He won't surpass Almiron. He might surpass them with all of the different triggers in it, which we don't know what they all are and what they were, but guaranteed money was like 11 for him. Barco will be more than Pitti, in my opinion, and he'll be less than Miguel, uh, even in the current climate. I think that's true. And if you take it inflation down the road when we start to know what the real effects of this are at, in the current markets, it's going to be Miguel Almiron level kind of money at that point. That's just those numbers are down right now. Um, Uncle says he's not an asset playing as little as he does. He is an asset. He's 100% an asset. He had a great U20 World Cup. He's had great moments here. That's not going to scare Sevilla Fiorentina from signing him. Um, he's absolutely an asset. They're not looking at him in the way that I think some fans are right now. They're just not. Uh, that interest felt pretty genuine. And when you start to connect the dots on where things were coming up and Lyon was meant to, mentioned as well, these are clubs who don't just throw money around stupidly and they don't just throw money around at players that aren't valuable. So, um, I get it. I know people want Barco to play more. I understand it, but Barco was also purchased for being an asset, um, and to be sold on. That was absolutely accurate, and they will make a profit off of it, and that will then go back into the team because that's how you grow a team. That's how you grow the cap in MLS. You make sales. You bring in allocation money. You do it. You go get the next DP. You can go get a bigger DP the next time around, and you continue to grow it, and Barco will be part of that process. I just I completely agree. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Ricky says, has South American World Cup qualifiers been on US TV before? I'm seeing they're going to be on pay-per-view. Yeah, they've absolutely been on TV before. Uh, BN had the rights for a long time. Uh, they've been on all kinds of different platforms. But right now, all of them but one game, it looks like it's going to be on pay-per-view. It's with uh, the, the Fight TV network, which does a lot of wrestling stuff. Um, and it's 30 bucks a game, which is bonkers. Mm. And like 180 for nine of the ten games that are going to be wow. in these first two rounds, uh, which is not giving you a discount. Nope. Um, or no, that's sorry, that is giving you a discount. I put them at 20 bucks a game, but I'm not watching all nine. I'd like to watch them more freely, and I'm really ticked off about this, but yeah. the person who bought the rights has opted to do this to make the most money, they think. And we'll see if they do. I'm a little skeptical on that. 
Uh, five Stripes Forever. Uh, welcome, Five Stripes Forever. I think you're new to the, the Twitch pitch. Uh, any update on ticket allocation for the home games in October? I don't have an update. Um, I Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the plan was to go through the season ticket holder base and probably start with seniority first and, and work through. And they have options on opting in to get tickets. Um, and then there could be tickets available if they're not all opted in on. But there's more season tickets than there are tickets available for these games. So it's going to be kind of like the uh, Open Cup or CONCACAF games at Fifth Third, where it's going to go through the season ticket base first. And if there are tickets left over, then they could be available on a public sale. But I don't know where that stands currently. There will be two games that there will be fans in the building for. Uh, the last two home games of the season. Burns says, who are your picks for the four teams to miss the playoffs in the East? So burned with the, uh, the negative question this morning. Um, four teams will miss. Right now, those four teams are Atlanta, Cincinnati, Miami, and D.C. The four teams that I think will miss are D.C., Cincinnati, Montreal, Mm, and that's a toss-up. Um, it's going to be one of Chicago, Atlanta, Miami. I think Nashville gets in. Red Bulls I was really worried about, but they seem to have turned a corner. NYC I think is going to be fine. New England, I don't think they're going to fall that far down. So I, I think D.C. and Cincinnati are the two that I would pick first. Yeah. Um, I think Montreal falls down. Yeah. They would be my next one. Then it's one of, and you could put Nashville and you could put Red Bulls in that conversation, but I think it's going to come down to Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, potentially Nashville, potentially Red Bulls. One of those is going to go. If I had to pick one right now, it'd be Miami. Yeah. Um, I think Montreal's out. I think Atlanta gets in. Yeah, I'm probably a little biased too, but I don't think Miami's good enough defensively. Yeah. I, I don't think Iguain solves that. And honestly, I think Iguain takes away some of the things that have made Miami dangerous at times with their high pressure because he won't do it. He can't. So I think they're going to have to change, and that's going to affect them, and I don't think their defense is good enough. So I, I have Miami missing right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, could go with, I could go with those four, and Miami was going to be my fourth for the reason that you said. Just d- defensively. I think they have problems, and then when you add Iguain to all of this, I think it creates more issues than it solves. It could. Uh, Captain says, I was at that Gold Cup game when the U.S. lost to Jamaica. Happy days. Not happy days. That was bad. And then you had a uh, crazy situation with Mexico and Panama afterwards. Madness. Um, boy, that was bad. Uh, Abby says, do you think Guzan needs a breather as well? Maybe Alec can in for 45. Um I, I think you'd give him a game. I yeah. don't know if it'd be 45. I, I, I'm never a, a huge fan of that. Could Alec get a match here when the schedule gets compressed? Yeah, I think he could. Um, he has not. He didn't play for the twos in game one, did he? No, Lungard did. Yeah, so Lungard. he has not played this season. Uh, maybe one of these midweeks you'd like to get him a game. Um, I'd have no problem with it. And... Brad's had some good moments and some bad. He's been more inconsistent this year than I think he's been in an Atlanta United kit. Uh, I hope it's just inconsistency due to 2020 being crazy. Um, It's too early to say that it's a a dip in form. But Alex hasn't played this season. So I'd have no problem with him getting a game. I'd be fine with that. Um, Uh, Go ahead. Answering your MBS question, nothing direct, but they said more information will be shared directly with season ticket members and fans in the coming weeks regarding ticket access and game day protocols. Okay. Uh, Strummer John said, does anyone have a link to the season ticket holder call video slash audio? I couldn't find it. I thought it was on Atlanta United's YouTube page, but uh, maybe people can help you out, Strummer, on the Twitch pitch. Um, Five Strikes Forever asked if the six-pack buyers got priority after the season ticket holders i'd assume so i I think that's how it's gone in the past so that would make sense but we're not sure for for sure 
Uh, Jason Nick says, can we blame Andrea at Leeds United for selling the rights to those games at an exorbitant right? I saw that he's in the media rights biz. Is he the one with the company that owns the rights to the World Cup qualifiers for South America here? Is that uh, 11? Is that 11 sports with Rod Rosani? I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't think he's with that company, Nix, but I'm not 100% sure. They've done this, like, different groups who have owned qualifiers have done the pay-per-view route. I mean, it's it's pretty typical. Uh, I remember U.S. away World Cup qualifiers being pay-per-view. Uh I remember, and, and not that long ago, um, I know for the 2010 cycle, there were some games that were really hard to see. I want to say for the 14 cycle, there were two. I don't think there were for the 18 cycle. I think BN had picked up everything outside of uh, the U.S. for those games in, in CONCACAF. I, I might be wrong. Um, I know they had at least a lot of them. Uh, South American games have been pay-per-view before, but not all of them. This is a lot. I'm not a fan, but... You buy the rights, you, you want to monetize them, this is what you try to do if you can't get somebody to pay for the TV rights to make your money back. Did you figure out if it, it's a... Uh... Well, if it is 11 Sports, you can't figure out what's going on at 11 Sports because their website is down. Oh, well, that's good. Um, that's probably why they're doing pay-per-view. So uh, yeah. I don't think it's them, but I might be wrong, Nick. So I'll see what I can find out. Uh, October 5th, and this, you, you said this, look for the email. So we're, we're catching up on the tickets for those last two home games. Um, do, 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 do. Burn says it won't be Chicago. It's going to be between Miami and Atlanta. I, I'm, I like Chicago. I, I think Chicago will get through. I think Nashville will get through. I, I'm with that, Burn. Uh, I think Montreal, Cincinnati, D.C., Miami, Atlanta, maybe Red Bulls, but They've got two good results back to back. I'm still not convinced, but they've got a cushion too. Um, I think the rest of them are okay, but yeah, I, I think Chicago should be clear. I think Chicago and Nashville both should be clear. I like both of those teams and what they've done. I think Nashville will get better with Cadiz. I think Chicago, if they stay healthy, will continue to get better. I, I like that attack. I like Aliceta a lot. I love that holding midfield with Jimenez and, and with Medron. Um, they're a tough team, and they've got Mihailovic and Herbers and Barich uh, in that front six as well. That's a really good front six. Defensively, maybe they're susceptible, but they're a lot better than Miami defensively. So, uh, let's see what else we got here. Uncle is very negative. I'm sorry, Uncle. Um, hopefully, it'll get better. Uh, I, I'm the offense in the offense needs to get better. I'm not as down on our defense um, in general from the run of play, but uh, you can't have the giveaways you did in Chicago. You can't have the giveaway you did on goal number one, and you just can't fall behind in games right now because your attack is weak. That's that's the the order that it goes in for me. Do to do to do. We are done here on the Twitch pitch. Um, lots of good conversation back and forth. Uh, they're trying to find the video for that season ticket holder call. Good luck. Uh, Abby says the midfield can't afford to make mistakes. I agree. The team can't afford to make mistakes because this is not LAFC right now where they still are a goal scoring threat. How much is a question? Atlanta's not a goal scoring threat at the moment. You just can't make mistakes. You can't fall behind. You can't give up early goals. These are things that just can't happen. And it's, you know, like, like I said on the full-time report, you know, it's not one of the, the teenagers who is making some of these mistakes. These are veterans that, that know better. And you do have mental fatigue. You do have physical fatigue. You make more mistakes when those things happen. That's accurate. You can't do it though. You got to find a way to deal with it. So, we shall see. Uh, tonight, you got Copa Libertadores. Today, you got a bunch of games on, on a bunch of different ways. It's a weird day for soccer on TV in the United States. You have La Liga, Real Sociedad, and Valencia at 1 o'clock. You got Carabao Cup on ESPN Plus, Tottenham, and Chelsea at 245. You've got Turkish Super League, um, or no, sorry, uh, Champions League qualifying. Yes. You've got Champions League qualifying on CBS All Access, on Two Day NA, on Galavision, on Two Day NA Extra. You've got more La Liga with Hetafe and Betis at 3 30. 
You've got Copa Libertadores tonight, 6.15 and 8.30. We'll talk about some of that tomorrow morning. We'll, we'll get you ready for Libertadores tomorrow as well. It'll be just a little bit of a shorter show tomorrow because stoppage time will start at 11. The Braves play early, so we're going to do stoppage time early if people want to watch the Braves. So we'll be on till about 10.45 Tomorrow, maybe we start a little early. Who knows? John's not a morning person, so that might not be a good idea. Uh, we learned that today, too. So You learned that I'm not a morning person today? Well, you today. declared it publicly. I'm not sharing your business publicly. I- I'm not uh, all us from Lyon talking about how people are broke and stuff. <laughs> you know, you, you put it out there, so that's it's public record now. John is, is not a morning person, so starting shocking. early I know might it's be a, to a, a rough a thing. Uh, but we'll finish about 1045 tomorrow morning, uh, and then we'll have stoppage time over on facebook.com slash 929dgame. Enjoy the soccer today. Uh, we'll keep you posted. We'll give you Mataflo's picks. If you have Copa Libertadores picks and you want to join the uh, Copa Libertadores prediction, whatever. Q. Q. Yes. Sure. Uh, tweet them at us at soccer down here. Spread the word on the Marcelino Moreno scarves. Por favor. We want to make as big of a donation as possible. Uh, fntz.co slash soccer down here for your Fanatis link to get hooked up. And I think that's about it. So thanks mm-hmm. for hanging out. Thanks for being part of the show. Thanks for all the questions. And we'll be back tomorrow. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all.